Welcome to the September 16, 2015 Town Council meeting on this oddly warm and muggy September evening. Um, so I am now calling the meeting to order. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And item number three is roll call. Councilor Bayvine? Present. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Caterina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Council Chair Holbrook? And I am here too. So we are moving on to item number four, which is general public comments. During general public comments, this is the time where you can rise and speak about non-agenda items. So again, if you have a comment that has something to do with other than an agenda item, please rise, head to the podium, state your name, address, so that the town clerk may record it, and you have three minutes. I'm Edward Benjamin, the youngest of the Benjamin family. We're here to discuss the land trust change of the name of the Benjamin Farm to the Pleasant Hill Farm, or uh, whatever they want to call it. Last year we had a nice discussion here at the town council to raise $2 million to, to buy the Benjamin Farm for the land trust. That $2 million was donated by the townspeople to buy that farm, not to the land trust, not for the land trust to go out there and change the name. On the news last Friday night at 5 o'clock on Channel 13, the Treasurer of the Land Trust says, we planned on changing that name from the get-go. They chased my father for 20 years to buy this farm, the gem of Scarborough, so they call it. Now they want to change the name. Why? They want to call it Pleasant Hill. It's not even Pleasant Hill. If that farm had a piece of property, a high spot on that farm, which was called Beach Hill. And I don't mind the preserve wanting to recognize the old family names that owned that different pieces of that farm. I think it's a great thing, but they should recognize the name as, let's put Cothard Family Trail or the Johnson Family Trail or the Robinson family trail. Now you look at it and say, well, you got $2,250,000. You sold it. You lost your right to say anything about it because you didn't stipulate what you wanted. You wanted the name kept. It's the trust we're talking to. This is, we trusted the land trust to do the right thing. This is not the right thing for the town or the taxpayers of Scarborough. This land belongs to the people, the taxpayers, the people of Scarborough. This is going to be open space forever. The intent, I took it as last summer when the board had this meeting, it was going to be the Benjamin farm. When they put that nice thermometer out there to, to raise funds and so forth, to buy the Benjamin fund, the half million dollars, the 250000 of that was for stewardship to, to maintain the open space and so forth. And I love the people for that interest, you know, to preserve this farm. But this name change and to deprive the people that they are the donators. This is what's going to happen with future farms. I don't want to see it to happen. If we're going to put bond money up, we're going to stipulate, as the townspeople, is what's the pride of the people wanting to name the piece that they're given? What's their point of view on it? It's got to be their voice spoken as well. Thank you. Elaine Richer, 5 Brief Lane, 28 East Grand Avenue. As you probably have read in the newspaper, Maine has a seaweed problem. The town cleans the beach at Pine Point once a week on Fridays during the summer and as needed. The as needed has no definition. So this year, it got cleaned twice in the July 4th week and the second time on September 1st, the first day the school opened and pretty much the end of the tourist season. 
In the past, this has not been ideal, but has been accepted with minor grumblings, maybe major grumblings. In the past three years, something has changed. A new red algae has started to appear in the water on Pine Point Beach. This invasive uh, plant is native to Japan, and it was believed to have been transported to the Atlantic coast on boat hulls, first appearing in Rhode Island and then coming up the coast and then probably going down the coast to Florida. Um, it creates vast decaying piles along the shore. The seaweed, uh, when it dries and decays, it smells. It emits a smell like rotting eggs. And if you know where the clam bake is and you know where the beach is, that smell goes past the clam bake. The species grows quickly and aggressively and can survive in warm and cold waters. For the environmentalists in all of us, there's something to be concerned about. There are fears that the invasive red seaweed is likely to impact the coastal ecosystem. It grows at a faster rate than native seaweed, which would lead to starving the native seaweed of light and air. This, in turn, would limit the marine animals who feed upon the na native seaweed. What scientists have learned about this species is if it's on the beach and gets back into the ocean, or if it gets cut up, it expands and it multiplies. So to contend with the smell and possibly the growth, we would like to see the cleaning of the beach to be a minimum of twice a week. So we would have to see an increase in the budget for next year. The cost right now is $25,000 to clean the beach once a week, which sounds like a lot of money. But if we put it in perspective, it equates to the taxes on one house on Pine Point Beach. We are not asking for any action on the town council, but just awareness of the issue at budget time. On a related matter, I think it's time for the town council to reevaluate the restricted area of Pine Point from the parking jetty, from the parking lot to the jetty. If the ordinance was put in solely for the safety of the plovers, it was thought at the time of the ordinance that the piping plover wanted a secluded area free of dogs and beach cleaning to nest. It turns out that they prefer and are thriving on Old Orchard Beach, which has daily beach cleaning, unleashed dogs on the beach until 10 a.m. and after 5, an amusement park nearby, hundreds of people on the beach, and fireworks every Thursday night. Who knew? So much of our thinking, much of our thinking that we know how the birds think is erroneous. Thank you very much. Paul Kirby, 3 Granite Street, and I'm here representing not only the property owners down at Pine Point, which are many of us, but also those of us who also own property that we uh, rent weekly to our summer guests. And uh, in the past few years, as Elaine mentioned, uh, the complaints by the renters who will help us pay our real estate taxes are complaining more and more about the amount of not only the red, that red seaweed but also the native seagrasses that come up every twice a day with the high tide. And I know it's a challenge, uh, but the complaints that we get as renters have increased exponentially in the past several years. Uh, and I'm, I'm one of many renters. Some of us have several units that we rent, and we hear it from all of them. Uh, they're going to other beaches. They're going down, down the street. Uh, or they may even uh, go up to the parks up on Route 1 because the kids don't find it that pleasant trying to get into the water through all the seaweed. Not only the red seaweed, but depending on the time of, of the tide, on the regular seaweed itself. Uh, I agree that, uh, you know, on a, on a very high tide, the, the regular seaweed, the grasses, uh, if they are on a high tide, they will stay there until the next cleaning unless there is a tide that can get up and pull it back, which uh, may not happen as the, as the tides get weaker. So that's what I'm addressing here. Uh, so again, uh, we want you to look at, at the budget. We know where a lot of the funding comes from uh, for uh, the maintenance of the beach. We do have the numbers, and we're just hoping that you will uh, take into account uh, when making that budget to ideally have a, a couple of cleanings a week. And if, in fact, there is a storm that comes on a Thursday or whatever, that uh, they would deposit a lot of that grass up on the beach on a nice, the next day being a nice sunny day, that we could somehow address that for all of the many visitors, not only those who come and rent 
those who come from away, but all the people, the residents of Scarborough that live up here and beyond, I think we all deserve, and I think they deserve, a nice, clean beach every day for their, for their friends, their families, and their children, and their guests who come for the weekend. So that's uh, our request that we consider uh, re-looking at the budget to find more funding for beach cleaning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Slezik. My address is 27 East Grand Ave, Scarborough. Um, I purchased a business here a year ago called the Beach House Market in Delhi, July 1st, 2014. I took over. Um, thinking that you guys have the nicest beach in Maine when we arrived. Um, I didn't get onto the beach July and August last year, way too busy trying to run a business, but heard complaints on a daily basis of people that have been coming to this area for 12, 15, 20 years, some from Canada, some from Massachusetts, some from New Jersey, that won't be returning because of the condition of the beach here. Um, I think it's the prettiest beach in Maine, but it doesn't get treated as such. It, to me, it's, it, it gets treated kind of abused. It gets, it gets cleaned once a week. Um, it's a direct hit on my business when people that are renting Paul's and everyone else's houses are loading up their trucks after two days and having to drive up to Old Orchard to find a clean beach where they can put their blanket out on. Um, I'm just here to ask that for two months out of the year, for July and August, um, no questions asked, that we step it up to twice a week to keep the beach clean while people that are on vacation that, that work 50 weeks out of the year to save their money to come up here for a week or two so that they at least have a clean beach while they're here. Um, it would help my business. It would help everybody out in the area. It would. It, it's the nicest beach in Maine, and it just it doesn't seem like it gets treated like it, it should be taken care of. I've been on the beach twice this week. Um, they cleaned the beach, I want to say, Tuesday, and the beach has been in pretty good shape all week. The water's a little bit clear, but it's after the season. Everybody's gone. It doesn't do any good at this time of the year. Um, I... I I had met with Tom earlier in the year and Elaine and Paul, and Tom had said that we need to get letters from people that were disgruntled with the beach. I just happened to put out some petitions in my store, and a couple of the people walked around the neighborhood with them, and I've got well over 300 signatures here of people that would love to see your beach taken care of a little bit better than it is. Um, that's all I have to say. just want you people to be aware of it. Does anybody care to have these? If you would give it to the town clerk, please. Thank you. Joan Laurie, 21 East Grand Avenue, Pine Point, Scarborough. I just have um, two comments to make right now. Um, one of them is, it may just be me, but I totally don't understand how amendments work with this council. If there's an issue that's on the agenda, and we get to, as the public, get to speak to that, and then an amendment is made, do we... I don't know if you can answer me at this point, but it's confusing as to whether we get to speak to that issue again once an amendment is added to it. So that's just a point of clarification, and maybe somebody can call me and explain that to me or make a general announcement. I think other people are confused as well. And the other thing I'd like to say at this point is um, until the courts decide which beaches are privately owned and what amount of beaches, you know, to what water line. I don't think that that should be referenced in council councilors' comments because it is not decided yet. And to mention that beaches are private and that the public is lucky that we get to use those beaches, it's really not true, I don't think. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you. So can we start this timer over? <laughs> Is this a timer? Okay. So Suzanne Foley-Ferguson, um, 331 Black Point Road. Uh, that's a good segue. Higgins Beach is a public beach consisting mm -hmm. so, of so. state... Um, can I interrupt for just a minute? Um, just want to remind you that this is general public comment. So this is not about the parking issue. This is about a general comment okay. about a public beach. Okay. No, I just was reminding you that it's for non-agenda items. So no, okay. Continue. Can we start three minutes over, please? 
I stopped that possible? It. I, I stopped it. No, okay, it's at 2.30. No, not when we were talking, it was going. I'd like it to be at three minutes. <clears throat> I timed my comments to three minutes. Can we put no, it at three minutes, like please? Thank you. Higgins Beach is a public beach consisting of state, state, municipal, maybe this, and some private parcels. Some of those parcels go to low tide. Not all of their parcels go to low tide. The municipal roads go to low tide. The state owns a big part of it. And the entire Sandy Beach portion has historically been used for public recreation and previous business uses. At least 50 to 60 percent of the owners at the beach community use their properties for rentals, including a house owned by a counselor who has a conflict of interest. This makes Higgins Beach unique in that it's not just a residential community, it's also a business community. Perhaps we don't tax them as it, but if it was in Portland, we'd be regulating these rental units. In addition, there are prescriptive rights involved as well as navigational rights. Counselors that continue to call Higgins Beach a private beach in town council meetings or in the press are acting reprehensibly. They do not have the authority to determine that private parcels, these private parcels, take precedence over these public parcels. That's the court's law. That's the court's determination, not our town council. We expect you to represent the entire public. <clears throat> they don't have the authority to determine that the public's prescriptive rights are lower than those private owners. The Justice Department in the late 1980s required that Scarborough put a handicap ramp in. As a town councilor, I was privy to those discussions and the very real threat of a federal lawsuit from the federal government. Apparently, the federal <clears throat> government believes Higgins to be a public beach. Furthermore, the taxpayer seawall here protects a public sand area by a public street called Bayview. Not only am I asking you to stop calling it private, I'm asking you to represent the public without bias by recusing a person who cannot act in the public's best interest and by not allowing other individual landowners to take up your time over relatively minor infractions of law so that they continue to privatize their beach. Municipalities have the power of eminent domain. Those people are paying on less than $800 worth of taxes. That's what they're assessed at. And Old Orchard took their properties by eminent domain. We could extinguish property owners' rights, and we should. Already there's been an access here that was a public access historically that's been extinguished, so people do know about extinguishing public's rights to the use of the water. I urge this council to stop the nonsense and instead use your money on a fair market appraisal of the sandy beach parcels underwater. Higgins Beach is a public beach. Please act in the interest of the entire community and the region. Thank you. There are no applause in the council meeting chambers, please. Is there any other speakers for general public comments? Again, they're for non-agenda items. Julie Hannon, Mast Road. I would like to speak to two items, um, but primarily <laughs> what I'd like to speak to is logic. Um, I was going to speak to the item that will be talked about later, but uh, there are two items that I'd like to speak to, and one of them is uh, uh, <laughs> when I read an article in the paper that we are we are patrolling one of our beaches for six hours a day, seven days a week. I've lived here for eight years. In the eight years that I've lived here, I've seen three police officers in my neighborhood for all of 30 seconds. Why are we patrolling a 54 square mile, or it's not miles, <laughs> uh, acre area Six, seven days a week, six hours a day. Why are we spending our money that way when we have so few reports? We probably have as many reports from that area as you do from my small area between Fog Road and Pleasant Hill. That needs to be addressed. Secondly, if we're talking about somebody that might need to recluse themselves from, from deliberations or from decisions, if you are living in a community that is directly involved in a decision that is being made, duh, that's a no-brainer. 
It doesn't affect the entire community of Scarborough. You need to recluse yourself. Make the decision. Ma'am, Thank you. So I, just in all fairness, again, I'm going to repeat that if it's an agenda item, you really need to wait for your comments then. Um, I guess I will let the cat out of the bag a little bit, that there's probably something else coming, but we're um, around the, these issues with some of the Higgins Beach, but it's not at that point in the meeting that we can address it at this time. So again, is there anybody else that wishes to speak for general public comment on a non-agenda item? All right, saying none, I'm going to close the general public comment. <coughs> item number five, minutes of the September 2nd, 2015 regular meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. moved. Second. Give okay. a first and a second. Is there any discussion, yeah. errors, omissions, or does everybody think it's <coughs> wonderful, the work that Cody does? Wonderful, Cody. All right, all those in favor, that is unanimous. Item number six is adjustments to the agenda. We do have one adjustment. We will have as a non-action item, which will be number eight, we will have a presentation from the police department. I believe Chief Moulton is making that presentation on a new program called Operation Hope, and there will be more information on that a little later. Again, that will be item number eight, non-action items. So. Items to be signed and treasurer warrants I will sign later in the meeting, which brings us on to order number 15-068 is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments of Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, Parking restriction, Restrictions, Section A, Parking Restrictions, Subsection 2, Higgins Beach. Before we take an offer the floor for public hearing, would you please bear with me and, and hold on for, for one moment? Um, I do believe Councillor Donovan would like the floor for a moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. As many of you are aware, there's been an ongoing plea from the Higgins Beach neighborhood to provide it with some protection against a whole series of issues invo involving inappropriate behavior and parking violations. This matter is before the Council. And recently, a group called Surfrider Foundation leveled a charge of conflict of interest against me because I own a house on Morning Street adjacent to Bayview Avenue. Surfrider Foundation is a national activist organization that promotes beach access, something I strongly support. In these circumstances, access is best advanced by enforcing the town's short-term parking policy on Bayview Avenue. I moved from Morning Street more than a year ago. The house is for sale and it's under contract. The property is also buffered from impact from Bayview Avenue by a fence built by the town before I ever became a counselor. I didn't ask for it. The town concluded that the impact of Bayview parking particularly harmed my property, so they built a fence. The town did the same for residents on Pearl and Ocean Streets when they built the new lot. The long and the short of it is, I do not stand to gain financially by the town council enforcing its short-term parking policy for Bayview Avenue. But my consideration cannot end there. While many people have encouraged me to ignore the conflict claim as specious, it should be important to all of us to protect the integrity of our town council proceedings. I want the process freed from any perception of a conflict. And so, with apologies for any distraction this has caused, uh, I recuse myself so long as I own property along Bayview Avenue. I would add that Main law indicates that it is appropriate for a counselor to, who is recusing him or herself to sit in the audience while the matter is considered. And this matter is now before uh, us for public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill Donovan. Is there any other counselor that wishes to make a disclosure? Councilor Blaze. Well, since Bill is jumped on the bandwagon, I might as well disclose the fact that I live at Higgins Beach. <coughs> of course, most of you people know that anyway. At least the council does. I don't own property. I, can't hear you. <coughs> I don't own property on Bayview Avenue. I don't live on Bayview Avenue. I live on Forest Street, which is 
probably three or four hundred yards away. Uh, and any decision that's made by this council on this subject, I don't stand to gain or lose. Uh, so I just wanted to disclose the fact that I am a resident of Higgins Beach, but I, uh, I am not going to recuse myself unless the remainder of the council feels it's necessary. So. Thank you, Councillor Blaze. Is there anybody else that wishes to make a statement? Uh, do you have a disclosure, Peter? Not a disclosure, but I'd like some clarity. <clears throat> um, what, what is your question? <clears throat> well, I, I heard Council Donovan say he's going to recuse himself as long as he owns property on Bayview. <clears throat> I just wanted clarity. We're not going to vote on the second reading until October 7th. Yes, that is correct. And I'd just like to get confirmation that the closing for that property is not scheduled between now and October 7th. At the pleasure of Councillor Donovan, do you have any type of, I, I, I realize that that can be, those fall apart sometimes, but. The, uh, um, the property's not presently, uh, doesn't presently have a closing date. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Because I think Donovan. it would be important, based on all the information we have, that it's clear and trying to get clarity that you recuse yourself from this dialogue and the vote mm -hmm. when it occurs, not subject to when you own the property. That's the clarity I'm trying to get. Uh, I will recuse myself so long as I don't own the property. Uh, so long as I own the property. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other disclosures or clarifying questions? All right. Seeing, seeing none, we are going to segue into the public hearing segment. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, before we come into public hearing, is there any interest in... Um, Offering a motion for a further recusal? Yeah, I, I, I would offer a motion that Councilor Donovan should be excused from these proceedings whenever it occurs, whether he owns the property or not. F future, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was a little unclear in that. Um, Procedurally, Councillor Donovan has already recused himself as chair. Um, obviously, we've accepted that. He's left. And um, my question is to whether or not are there any other councillors that um, we as a council feel should recuse themselves from this meeting this evening. Um, as far as our next meeting, that will be something we'll need to take up at the next meeting, which is a different date. In it. But for this evening, is there any other recusals or disclosures or interest in a motion for a councillor continuing to participate tonight in the public hearing. All right, seeing none, we're going to go ahead and move forward from that. So now we're going to come to the public hearing. Thank you for your patience. Please, again, you can rise to the podium, state your name, address. You do have three minutes. Huh? Point of order, Madam Chair. The question order number 15. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, Excuse me, you're not, re Sue, please sit down. You're not recognized to speak at this time. Ma'am, you're not recognized to speak. Please sit down. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, can we, for, for wait, clarity, hold, hold it for just, can I appeal that? I, I'd like to hear what her point of order is. I don't know what. Point of order has to be called within, from another counselor. If she would like to address the council as a whole, she may, and she may come, come to the podium to clarify. My point is we do have rules of decorum. You need to come to the podium, state your name and address, and you can address the council as a whole. It's not stand up and speak at a turn and, and, and bulldoze your way through. It is a council, there's rules, and there's procedures. So if you would like to come to the podium and state your name and address, please continue and make your comments. My point, Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Row. My point of order, Madam Chair, is that order number 15-068, the public hearing is not in order for this meeting because the counselor Donovan has recused himself and the question that is approved to be read at this public hearing is now voidable in a court of law. Therefore, the question is taken back to the original motion. Thank you for your comments. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? Are we in public hearing now? What channel? Are we in public hearing? We haven't, we haven't, we haven't made a Madam motion in public hearing. Yes? Wait, what, what, is, what is the item on the... Um... We have the public... 7 p.m. I'll repeat. 
We are on order number 15-068, which is a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, Parking Restrictions, Section A, Parking Restrictions, and Subsection 2, Higgins Beach. It is a public hearing only. It is not a second reading. So, okay. Right. No discussion from us. No. No. Right. It, there's no discussion from the council during a public hearing. You take input from the public I'm only. The order is that there is discussion within the council. They have to. They can appeal the council chair if they would like. Sue, so, I, I will say, but. <laughs> If another councillor would like to offer a motion for reconsideration, I will consider it. However, Sue, this is my last warning. You speak out of order again. I'm going to ask for your removal. Is there a councillor that would like to offer a motion of reconsideration? Yes, I would. <coughs> I'm not sure. Reconsideration? Of, for of what? what? I, I'm not sure if that's in order at this point. Reconsideration. We have a five-minute recess, please. I actually, I'm calling a five-minute recess. I would like to have our Q policy up, please, about the
Welcome back. Thank you for your patience while we conferred with our wonderful town clerk who printed us off um, some clarifying rules. Tom, if you will. Yes, uh, certainly a point of order is always in order from a member of this body, uh, and that supersedes and stops discussion um, in its tracks. Uh, it's then the council's chair, uh, the council chair's responsibility to make a ruling on that point of order. And um, I've advised the council chair, though this came forward uh, out of order, if you will, from a member of the public who didn't have standing, there does appear to be interest in an important matter that should be settled before you proceed. So um, I've suggested the council chair, um, in her responsibility as chair, uh, address this matter and make a ruling um, at this point. Um, so thank you again for your patience and um, waiting for me to clarify that. Um, I do believe at this time I choose as the chair that I do believe it is in the best interest and within my right to um, rule that we are not out of order following through with the public hearing. And so with that, if there is, um, again, you know, if, unless there is any other point of order at this point, we'll go ahead and reconvene our public hearing. Thank you again for bearing with us. So uh, this is the public hearing, and I will read the order again on the proposed amendments of Chapter 601, the Town of Scarborough Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, Parking Restrictions, Section A, Parking Restrictions, Subsection 2, Higgins Beach. This is the public hearing. If you would wish to speak on this item, please rise, come to the podium, state your name, address for the town clerk to record for the official minutes and record, and you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Julie Hannon, Mass Road. Um, I, would like, I would like to urge the council to please uh, make a decision whether or not this is parking or whether or not this is drop-off. Because 30 minutes, I believe, is far too short of a time to be parking. Uh, whether it's for a dog walk or whether it's for a walk on the beach, uh, 30 minutes is really an extended drop-off time. So either it's a drop-off, uh, and like others, it's a 15 minute, or it's parking, and if it's parking, let's give people ample time to enjoy the beach area, and that would be at least an hour. Consider that. Consider that. A half hour period of time is going to create additional noise regardless. But a half hour is really just a longer period of drop off. So either it's a drop off or it's parking. Please make a decision for us. Thank you. Hello, Seth Fernald, 45 Maple Avenue, Scarborough. Uh, the limiting of the 30 to the 30 minutes just seems a little unnecessary. For a lot of us, it takes about that long to even get down to the beach. We have a little boy back here, probably here, a little eight-month-old. He's cried a couple times. Uh, just to get his stroller in and out of the car it takes 10 to 15 minutes. At that point, half our time is gone, and we're left to really walk down to the water, touch it, and get back to the car. Uh, so I, I don't really see much need in limiting that to the 30 minutes. Um, it seems we're passing more strict rules to stop those who are not obeying the rules currently. That's what I keep hearing counselors, everybody being quoted saying, surfers are down there parking for two or three hours, uh, so we want to pass more strict rules because we're not enforcing the rules we have now. I, I don't understand that. You're taking those who abide by the law and you're, you're just you're penal, you know, penalizing us. I don't really understand that. Uh, and then to that, the police, when the chief has spoken here about the complaints they actually have about the, uh, the nudity, the parking, all these big problems that are happening, they don't really seem to have any real problems that they're identifying, but we're saying they're happening. Uh, I don't understand where that's coming from. Um, the recent change today about uh, a councilman uh, recusing himself from the vote, um, I, I guess I appreciate that for now. You know, with the stipulation that while he, doesn't, while he owns the property, it's these stipulations and odd things that happen, the town council has been kind of happening for the last year or so, that I think the town's kind of starting to distrust the council. You saw with the dog vote, it seemed, I went door to door and talked to people, a lot of people just said they don't like the process that's happening. They, they came out in record numbers, not just because of the dogs, it wasn't solely about dogs. It was about trying to privatize the beach and the town council taking these steps just above and beyond and going way out of their, just seems like out of their way to make it more difficult on the people in the town to privatize. So I think you should, hopefully I thought we were going to learn something from that vote with a record vote we've had, over 4,000 people, to stop you know, overreaching and trying to privatize the beach, trying to take away the people's rights and access to things. 
Um, again, I, it, it got brought up today too, is this beach, are these beaches public or private? When we're passing dog ordinances, the beaches become public and we're allowed to take away the rights. When we're talking about parking and, and access, become private and at any second the, the beach owners can just take away the rights. So I, I get confused, it seems to be we're saying which side of the item we're on, which side of the fence we're on, we just jump off over and over, it's public, it's private, it depends on what we want. So it's, some clarity there would be very nice and the whole town would appreciate that as well. Oh, thank you. Elaine Richer, 5 uh, Reef Lane, 2080 Grand Ave. Uh, two weeks ago I hadn't planned to speak on this topic because I don't frequent that beach, Higgins Beach, and I really don't know the issues. But when the amendment came up and the question was on consistency between Co-op Beach and uh, Higgins Beach, I thought I'd want to speak on this. I agree it is uh, important to be consistent in rules, but the consistency must apply to comparable properties. When you go to the town website and search beaches, the beaches that turn up are Ferry, Pine Point, Higgins, and Scarborough Beach. There is no co-op beach listed. So you're trying to make an ordinance on Higgins consistent with a beach that is not even considered to be a beach by the town. I've never heard of the term co-op beach until the situation with the piping plovers, and I've been in Pine Point for 30 years. Um, this is really an extension of Pine Point Beach. Not, not a separate one. The next thing is that the co-op is zoned um, business B1. The co-op is a boat launch, a restaurant, there's a fisherman's co-op, there's parking, there's uh, bathroom facilities. Bayview Avenue is, is zoned residential R3. When has the town in the past tried to have consistent ordinances between a business zone and a residential zone? When you compare a residential area like Higgins Beach to a commercial area like uh, the co-op area, why do you feel the need to create the same rules for both? Now, I'm sure you've driven by both areas, and you've seen that they don't, they're not similar in any way. We've got 11 parking spaces in Higgins Beach, and we have this gigantic parking lot at the co-op. There's a strip of 30-minute parking. There's parking for boat trailers. There's long-term parking for those going to the restaurant or fishing or boating. The 30-minute parking in the co-op doesn't cause any hardships because there is an alternative, which is the long-term parking area. It seems to the many residents of Scarborough that this is an ordinance with ulterior motives and not about consistency. Uh, good evening, Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, so I think someone spoke to this a little bit earlier, and I hope I'm speaking to the right thing because we are talking about parking. Um, but the, the point made earlier was around confusion around what happens, you know, first, second reading, public hearing, which order we do things in. And I, and I, so I just want to comment on this idea of parking meters because my understanding is that it will come up, but then by the time you have your discussion on meters, it, it potentially could have been the second reading and then the public wouldn't be able to comment after. So I just have a couple of things and I'm going to continue to um, speak with counselors. I have a meeting set up with Councillor Bayvine, hear his thoughts on meters, but I have a couple of things I'd like you to consider as you go forward with that, if you do. Um, one, has a cost-benefit financial analysis have been, been complete on what those costs and what your time to recoup on that would be. Um, I'd love to hear the Chief Moulton's expert opinion on the enforceability of what, what does a meter improve for us, uh, in other words, when we have quite a, quite a bit of police presence down there already. Um, so I'd love to hear him weigh in on that. And then last and not least at all, in my opinion, is that meters are ugly. Um, I know that's silly, but Megan's <laughs> Beach is beautiful. We have too many signs as it is. So um, that's my piece on that. Um, this afternoon, I had uh, an opportunity to sit in on a strategic planning session with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. Um, first thought I had was, why am I here and not my sister? Because really, conservation is her thing. Um, but in the last two years, I've come to realize it's my thing, too. Because when you talk about conservation, you're talking about access. And uh, if you believe in conservation, you must believe in access and connect those two dots. So access means not just the ability to get to something, but also the ability to actually use it. 
um, for reasons I mentioned last time with my own disability, uh, 30 minutes is just not adequate for me to walk up and down Higgins Beach, and that doesn't include stopping to pick up a seashell um, or have a conversation. So I think an hour, to me, an hour is reasonable for short-term access. Um, I want to clarify one thing from a little bit earlier. It was not only the Surfrider Foundation that requested uh, Councillor Donovan's recusal. Um, the Dog Owners of Greater Scarborough did as well. We supported that request. Um, and mostly due to the pr <laughs> amazing number of emails I was getting um, from citizens who uh, also supported it. So it wasn't just a national foundation, it was local. The last thing I'll say, I have 15 seconds left. Um, is that the advice uh, to that, it, that a member of the public is allowed to uh, stand and call a point of order was given to us by an attorney. So if that's wrong, I apologize, um, but it, it was not something we just did arbitrarily. So thank you. Joan Laurie, 21 East Grand Scarborough. Um, first, I'd like to mention that I've been busy writing emails to the counselors about these issues, and I want to thank the ones that took the time to answer me. Uh, that was appreciated. Um, one of the emails that I sent was written on returning home after the previous meeting, where before the surf riders posted their letter, I wrote a letter because it was so clear to me that people that own property at Higgins Beach want to protect their little piece of heaven. And voting on issues that affect Higgins Beach, it, doesn't, it just does not set right with me. So even though Councillor Donovan, who lives on Bayview and is directly impacted, I think that Councillor Blaze is in the same situation, owning property and voting on issues that affect that area. Um, and my other, I, and the other, I have a question. I would love to know how many people, uh, how many general Scarborough residents are asking for those parking meters or complaining? I mean, is it just the Higgins Beach people that are concerned with these issues or are other Scarborough residents complaining about parking and nudity and whatever else has, you know, been discussed. Because if it's just local homeowners or property owners, it's just such a disservice to the rest of the town. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rick Davies. I live on 348 Black Point Road. Higgins is a public beach. There are taxpayer amenities, a parking lot with a road right to the water. No one should be advocating the notion that, that private interests control what happens on this beach. The proponents of new ordinances are wasting our money. This is a clear attempt to privatize one of the most popular beaches in the greater Portland area to benefit a per personal agenda based on property values and rental incomes. For the past two decades, number of on-street parking and the capacity of the lot have been reduced. The purchase of the lot and improvements to parking and sidewalks have only served to aesthetics, not beach integrity and public access. I personally don't like 95% of the surfers. I am a surfer. I'm here for my family, my friends, and that 5%. I know people abuse the one-hour time limit They'll probably get a ticket. That discussion is over. Most are tourists and don't want to pay to park and will simply be moving on. Any issues with doors slamming or raised voices have clearly been exaggerated and on a moderate level are common in a public space. Any local surfer that uses the Bayview spots when the lot is open in the summer months for reasons of time restraints and access is just being lazy. It takes no time to skip from the lot down to Pearl or Ocean Ave. The Bayview spots are vital in the off season for surfers and beachgoers. I also stress the importance of the lot being open after first light and if not, street parking being allowed. 
It is extremely frustrating to see so much time and energy go into something of such little merit. There is a problem with the use of town assets and taxpayers' money to promote and implement an agenda that is contrary to the public good. The disregard of beach integrity is appalling. The lack of raised walkways on all pathways to the beach is unacceptable. The proliferation of asphalt and concrete for improvements weakens natural filters and runs everything straight to the beach. There are increasingly more problems, natural and man-made, that arise and will need more attention than this current debacle. Our population and popularity is growing, as will the number of people that visit and move here. Let's all take a step back and make an honest and clear judgment as to the necessity of all of this and focus on real problems affecting our community. Okay. Paul Rising, 15 Shipwreck Road. Um, I, want to, I, I too share some confusion about uh, terms and how they're used in relation to this, uh, to the, the whole, all of the different Higgins Beach issues, but including the parking. Uh, it's been claimed throughout the discussion on Higgins Beach, both here and in the media, that there's a significant threat to public beach access at Higgins Beach. Uh, I can't talk to what, what may be scuttlebutt, uh, but in terms of what is an action item, I don't see something that changes my experience of, uh, of uh, my knowledge of Higgins Beach. There isn't any threat in that way, nor has there ever been one. There's been no fight for public beach access because they didn't need to be. As far back as memory goes, the Higgins Beach community has been welcoming to the public to use the beach for all customary beach activities. This includes surfing, which had arrived at Higgins Beach before 2000 and has been growing ever since. For beaches in Maine where beach access has been an issue, see the court cases involving Moody Beach, Wells Beach, and more recently, Goose Rocks Beach. In these cases, public beach access has two major components the public getting to the beach from public land, possibly over privately held property, and the issues allowed once one is on the beach. At Higgins Beach specifically, access is provided in several locations along public ways, either directly off Bayview Avenue or along side streets and downtown stairs to the sandy beach. And all the customary uses of the beach are permitted, including surfing and dog walking. There are some limitations. Surfing is prohibited during the middle of the day during the summer when general Beach use is heavy. Dogs, in addition to being limited to the early morning and evening hours in the summer, are not permitted at the far end of the beach during the, t the time two endangered species are nesting and fledging. These restrictions arise out of the need to share this popular beach among various constituencies, including the general public. The con current controversy around the parking spaces on beach Bayview Avenue in involves a different type of access. As far as I know, parking is not included in the core concept of public beach access, though it is related. Recall that there are 15, 11 public parking spaces created by the town council five years ago intended for short-term use. They are free and more convenient to the beach itself than the parking at the town lot of uh, Ocean Avenue. They do come with a time limit, however, currently that limit is one hour, and I support keeping it at that duration. The issue of access arises when you have found a parking space and want to stay longer than the one hour limit. It is easy to do if you're looking out only for your interests. However, if you approach this matter in a spirit of cooperation, you can put others' interests alongside your own and see that honoring the time limit, although it may inconvenience you, allows more people to enjoy the benefits of these highly prized spaces. It is in accord with the principle of considering the interests of all and promoting cooperation among all stakeholders, surfers, dog walkers, beach goers and the general public. It also supports the use for which they were intended and eases the burden of enforcing the limits. In, su in summary, as compared to several other main beaches, Higgins Beach does have public access with no common beach activities prohibited. Thank you. Caitlin Berry, 8 Robinson Road, Scarborough. I go to Higgins several times a week, all times of the day. I've been following all these discussions, reading the papers, listening to meetings. I'm just blown away at this point how much time, energy, resources are being spent 
on complaints about noise, public indecency, public urination from a small minority that appear unsubstantiated. We've heard from other residents of Higgins Beach that live there as well that have stated that these just aren't problems. We've heard from residents of the town that use the beach. We've heard from the police chief. All these issues are just non-existent, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of other people's. I think it's time to move on from those. I think that I can, I can understand if people are parking there longer than an hour, the spaces are designated in as an hour, that's what they should be used for. One hour is short-term parking. Uh, this is a reasonable amount of time for people to enjoy the beach, whatever activities they may be doing, whether it's going to have a picnic, whether it's going to walk the length of the beach, a short surf, a paddle, a swim. Um, those activities are reasonable to do as long as they're being done within that hour. Um, furthermore, there are people with physical dysfunctions that have conditions that don't necessitate handicap plates. I think that that's something that's often overlooked or misunderstood. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. I see a lot of people with limited endurance, um, limited respiratory abilities, limited mobility, or a senior citizen that just can't walk that distance. And I think that it's reasonable for them to be able to use those spots for an hour. Um, you know, on a personal note, my grandmother, she it takes her 10 minutes to get from the car to the beach, 10 minutes to get from her spot back to the car. That leaves her 20 minutes to use the spot if you were to change it to a half an hour. Um, you know, my husband he rented a paddleboard the other day and he had limited time to use it. It's 45 pounds to carry it. He parked in the one hour space, used it for an hour, set his watch and respected the time limit, got out and used it appropriately. I think most people are respected, respectful of the one hour parking. Um, now, I know Chairwoman Holbrook made a point that if you put up a sign, most, the majority of people do follow that. And I think that's true. And I think well, the majority of people are following that. Um, and I think that to restrict this to a 30 minute time limit only punishes those who have been abiding by that one hour rule and gives them less time to enjoy the beach. Um, I don't think this, this shortening of the beach time solves any issues. Um, it just whittles away public access. I know there was a discussion about cameras. I don't know if that's still in the mix, but I think it's a more logical and feasible solution. I hear a lot of blanket statements um, and generalizations that spaces are being used two to three hours. Um, perhaps a camera is a better idea um, because it would give an undisputable view. Um, any issues would be ID'd and ticketed without barring access to entire groups of people. Um, and furthermore, I think it just needs to be said that when we isolate what activity, we, we try to point out what activities can be done in that hour time period, you just create further animosity between groups of people. And I think we it doesn't give a community-minded solution to things. Um, if something has to be done about it, that perhaps is a better option. I don't see that there's a widespread issue among even Higgins Beach residents. But if there has to be some kind of solution, perhaps that's a more logical and sensical alternative than shortening the parking. Good evening. I'm Karen Haskell, 21 Fifth Street, Higgins Beach. I see several issues related to the topic of this parking. The first is that um, my recollection is four or five years ago when you created the 11 parking spaces, that was a temporary measure until we had uh, or you had purchased the parking lot. We've now purchased that. You've created a very nice facility there, so I think that um, that temporary need has been met. There's been a lot of talk about access, public access, and I think it's an inappropriate word for this particular situation. When I think of um, limited access, I think that there must be a big fence in front of the um, beach with uh, one door that you go through and you pay or what have you. But in fact, Higgins Beach has been welcoming over the years and denied no one the ability to use the beach. The issue for me is parking next to the beach versus parking a block and a half away. And so it's not access, it's convenience. The third issue is safety. Between cars jockeying for a parking spot 
and beach belongings spread out on the sidewalks. Pedestrians are walking in the street or walking around possessions. This seems like the convenience for a few versus the safety of many people, particularly children. And finally, quality of life. Noise, undressing, again seems to be the convenience of a few versus the distress of many. I recommend the elimination of parking, totally with the exception of handicapped spaces, in the interest of fairness to all. This topic has divided our community. Let's end the division and return to our sense of community where everyone equally walks the block and a half to the beach. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. My name is Kurt McKesson. I live on Houghton Street. Our family has owned a house on Houghton Street for uh, 25 years, and I would like to talk on behalf of restricting uh, the parking at Higgins Beach. So I am a surfer, and I went to our garage today, and I counted the number of surfboards. So we have five surfboards, one stand-up paddleboard. We have um, six sea kayaks and one surf kayak. So we've been taking our beach equipment, our surfboards, down to the beach for 25 years. I wish I was a better surfer than I am right now. Um, so this whole argument that we're limiting access to the beach is, is ridiculous to me. And the reason for this is that we have this big public lot with 90 spaces up there. They've done, redone the bathhouse. You have, um, you have toilets there. You have showers there. You can make the, the argument that we've actually increased access to the beach. So I'm trained as an engineer, so as an engineer I like facts and figures, so I went out and did a little fact finding today. So I said, how long does it take me to walk from our house on, on, on Houghton Street down to the beach? So I timed this and it was two minutes and 45 seconds. I said, well, that's not too bad. You know, I always thought it was a privilege to be able to carry my surfboard for only, you know, I'll round up to three minutes down to the beach. So I went from the public uh, parking area and walked that to the beach and it took three minutes and 45 seconds. And I said, you know, it's only a, a minute more for them to carry their surfboard down to the beach than it is for me to carry my surfboard down to the beach. And I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, this, this is almost something like you go to the health club and you see people, you know, trying to get into the parking spot, you know, by the, by the front of the health club. You know, all these surfer guys are pretty fit. They're a lot younger than me. I don't think working for, walk, walking for four minutes with a surfboard is, is any big inconvenience. Um, so another thing, um, um, I'm, um, uh, so my day job is with a chemical company, and we have a uh, culture of safety. And the other person brought this up, and thank you for bringing it up, is that I think the bigger issue is a safety <coughs> issue down there. Uh, both my parents are 85 years old, and they have, a, they have a walkway down along there, and we walk down along there, we're walking there this summer, probably half the cars down there had their car doors open, so you could not use the sidewalk. So people then walk in the street, and people have their doors open in the street, and then there's cars coming by, so it's almost more of a safety issue than anything else. And just another observation, so this Saturday was, was very nice surf day. I got out to surf, and you were allowed to surf um, from, from, on Higgins Beach from June 15th to December 15th, and you, can, um, you cannot surf um, after 11 o'clock in the morning until 5 o'clock in the evening. So I went down at uh, about 11.30 and counted the number of surfers that were out there. And there was 86 surfers. I was at Black Point Surf Shop on Monday, and I was talking to the guy down there. He said at 12.30 he went out and he counted over 100 surfers. So it was apparently, you know, having um, access to the beach is not a problem because there's 100 surfers, and they shouldn't even be out there. You know, because there, you know, it was after 11 o'clock in the morning. So thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Kane. Uh, I live at Gunstock Road. My extended family uh, owns a place on Ocean Avenue at Higgins Beach. Um, two weeks ago, uh, the council has re reached a very logical conclusion after all was said and done. And as councilor, as uh, the um, chair. Uh, laid out and other people agreed, they basically took a measure to, the, to ensure the initial intent of an ordinance that created those spaces in the first place. Uh, and that was that contained in the whole process, surfers would continue to use the parking lot as their method of parking at Higgins Beach. 
as they had done for decades prior to, I think it was 2011. Um, the choice was a, you know, the 30 minute choice uh, has, I've heard some uh, reasonable arguments against the 30 minutes. So I want to focus us on the surfing community, uh, a somewhat uh, noisy group uh, that is a national uh, lobbyist group. I think that's too strong, but I can't think of anything else. That has tossed a lot of misleading characterizations out there. Among other falsehoods has been that the Higgins Beach community is trying to limit access for their clients. That is simply not true. You've heard the same thing from a couple of other folks up here. Um, I went to the, you know, I, a dictionary definition of access. Mine and Noah Webster's access equals I can get in. For this group who's pushing so hard, there is a demand for the most perfectly convenient access possible for myself. So that might be a little stronger than other people have put it, but I think that's really what we're facing. Um, we see a parking facility that is open at 5.30 in the morning. It's free when surfers would show up. It has a new changing facility that serves their needs and is a very short walk, as was just mentioned, for those able-bodied enough to surf. Uh, what was declared here uh, two weeks ago was that that situation is equal elimination of access to the beach. Uh, the best I can say to that is nonsense. Any surfer willing to park in that lot will always find access to the beach. Very, very seldom is that lot full before 9 in the morning <coughs> or after 5 in the afternoon. Um, I want to reiterate that we at Higgins Beach uh, have a complete commitment to access for visitors and accommodation of many different uses, not just one. Beach walkers, dog walkers, surfers, the occasional volleyball net, uh, families with kids, people who fish and the last couple of years endangered shorebirds have all got their uh, access. We do not want to privatize the beach. I don't want to live on a private beach. Hmm. We're not snobby, and we wouldn't <laughs> want to live at Goose Rocks Beach or these other places that have had that kind of trouble. The 2011 ordinance was meant to have surfers continue to, to use the lot and others with a greater need, and we've heard some of that tonight about people who can't use it in 30 minutes, uh, for those Bayview pay spaces to use them. Your vote in the last meeting and the switch to 30 minutes will provide a better chance for that to happen as far as the surfers using up the top, uh, but it's not going to help some of the folks that object to the 30 minutes. So here's what I would ask for. Um, if another idea arises that can achieve the same result, having the surfers park in the lot, please exercise it and consider it. But if not, please use logic over emotion and leave in place what we did at the last meeting. Thank you. Hi, Patty Daly, 54 Greenwood Avenue, Scarborough. It was a tough act to follow. <laughs> Give you a brief, uh, my family's been here, been coming here since I, for 75 years, okay? My family owned a cottage here for 55 years. I'm fortunate enough to have my own cottage now for three years. And uh, I just don't understand. There was never parking on a street, to my knowledge, ever. There was a little place next to the hotel that burned down or took f a long time ago, but there's never, ever been parking on the streets at Higgins Beach. This is a temporary fix. I know it was before they built that lovely uh, changing parking area, and it's such a small beach. Uh, there are times, even on the weekend, where people own the air kind of even use the beach because it's a small beach. When the parking lot is full, some of us don't even go there on the weekend. They know it's crowded. But I have a brother who surfs. I have nothing against the surfers, but I've spoken with them, and they absolutely refuse, refuse to change in that wonderful facility that has been <clears throat> paid for by we taxpayers and some of the people who live in this community actually chipped, chipped in for it. I just don't understand what's going on. It's, it's, uh, and it is, I have to disagree with those two ladies, it is a private beach with public access. And I think with over 80 parking places with such a small beach, that should be ample because, as I say, it's a small beach and it, it gets very, very overcrowded. And I don't understand why the surfers will not use that wonderful changing facility. I walked it today myself, and I did it in three minutes, I guess 45 seconds uh, before that other gentleman. And I was walking slowly, and I'm not a young kid, as you can see. So... Uh, 
I, I've been coming here, as I say, for years. My brother loves to surf. I love watching the surfers. I love dogs. I'm an animal uh, lover. So there's just no, never been a conspiracy to prevent people from using this beach. It's open to everyone. It's more open now than it ever has been 75 years ago. You had to know someone, park on someone's lot. There was just nothing available. Now we've made it into this wonderful place that I enjoy. I feel so lucky to be here. And trust me, I'm not a rich person. <laughs> uh, anyway, I wanted to refute uh, Ms. St. Clair. She said that most of the people who park there, the surfers, live in Scarborough. They're taxpayers. She's never been there, obviously. They're all they're out of state. They've been from Canada. I, go, I walk and pick up the beach every morning at 7 o'clock with two other gentlemen. I, I mean, two that. gentlemen. I'm not a gentleman. I'm a lady. So, and the surface had said that, uh, and one thing I wrote, it was it, that the, the beach was messy because of the owners, and I totally disagree with that. They've changed their tune now since they found out that some of us pick up every day and sometimes twice a day. There could be renters who trash it, but uh, we pick it up. We volunteer, three of us, every day, and we're happy to do it. We get thanks from the other residents. But now it's so funny. Now the surface have started to thank us. <laughs> they don't pick up anything. They walk by it, but they've changed their attitude, and now we're getting great thanks from them. It's if it's their beach. It is their beach, but it is a private beach, and we try to keep it as clean and nice as possible. Thank you. Just so you know, I didn't make that comment. About most of the surface? Yeah. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. I was there at that meeting. Oh, okay. I have um, to disagree with you. Oh, sorry. Show it to me. Send it to me. I didn't. I didn't. <coughs> it was at a meeting. Everybody, please. Please, okay. you know, but that means that most, most of the people who are there. parked there are from Kate, Scarborough. Please. Okay, oh, then Kate, fine. Ask, I must please. be losing my mind. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sharma Kibitiski. I'm at 386 Black Point Road, Scarborough. Um, for nine years, my husband and I lived at Higgins Beach on Pearl Street Extension. And this was before... Uh, the big fence was built by the private landowners of the parking lot before <coughs> the town bought it. And what was in the play, uh, in place of the <laughs> fence along our property were a series of pine trees, which were very pretty. Well, since when we moved there, we endured just, uh, it was a, her a terrible experience for us. Every morning between 4 a.m., to 5 a.m., surfers would come into the parking lot because it was open to anybody who wanted to come day or night, pull up to our house, the lights blaring into our house, music blaring, lights on, doors, then the doors started going open and closing, open and closing, talking, all this noise. I can't tell you how many times I jumped out of bed and ran into the parking lot at 4 a.m. to tell them to please stop and listen and they would listen. I said, do you hear how quiet it is? I said, that's because people are sleeping here. This is a residential area. So this went on and on and on for nine years. We had to put up with this. Before the fence was built, the surfers would come, and I know that the indecency thing is off the table, but I can't tell you how many times the surfers would come and undress because they thought nobody was looking. We had a second floor. Many times our three granddaughters would be there, little girls, who could see what was going on. And uh, my husband would have to go out and say, please, don't, don't do this. We have little girls that are watching you. There was a porta potty at the end of the parking lot for years. You probably all remember that. They, very few uh, used the porta potty, let me tell you. They used the trees. So at, at the end of nine years, we had had enough. So we decided to leave. That was the only alternative, because we heard that the town was going to buy the parking lot. We didn't know what was going to happen, but by that time, we, we just wanted out. And that's a sad commentary on uh, the behavior is that uh, when the town bought the parking lot and it was cleaned up and really nice and monitored and everything, all that behavior, indecency, noise, slamming doors and everything, those behaviors are not fabricated and they're not exaggerated. 
than not by a small number of people. It happened frequently. And I would just like to tell the council that for all the people who say that the uh, property owners are a small elite group of people who just want to keep it private and all that, I would remind the council that the surfers are, are just a very small minority of the residents of Scarborough and beyond. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Siebert. Uh, I'm a sometimes resident of 24 Bayview Road. So when I spoke here at the September 2 council meeting, I was trying not to make this a surfers versus the beach owners a showdown. But they, the surfers, quickly drew that law line in the sand, so to speak. So I'm speaking tonight for myself, as well as the extended Levitt clan of six families with 20 in interested individuals. Fifteen are direct descendants of James P. Hutchinson, who built their Bayview Avenue property in 1902. This statement should carry the weight of this group. So, I am also a surfer. I gave to the Surf Rider Foundation five years ago when they were raising the money to contribute to the parking lot. It seemed like a good organization that supported progressive causes. At that time, they were very happy with the plans for the parking lot because they felt it would give them good access to Higgins Beach. There were no legal parking spaces yet built on Bayview Avenue. The town was satisfied with the new parking lot plan, as were many residents of Higgins Beach, thinking that this would allow for more public access and put the parking issue to rest. The parking issues on Bayview Ave were built about a year later for short-term visits. It was expected that they would be used primarily by Scarborough residents. Now the surfers, most of whom are not Scarborough residents, have laid claim to the parking spaces and they will not give them up. The town built a bathhouse for changing and many surfers won't use it. I have done a little research and I found that the, the free early morning parking in the lot and between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. during the season in the, in the hour spaces on Bayview Avenue is the only free public parking for Ocean Beach access in the states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Let me repeat that. It is the only free public parking for Ocean Beach access in these states. Free beach parking in season just doesn't exist anywhere else. At many beaches, parking costs as much as $25 a day. You would think that because the one-hour parking on Bayview is free, that the surfers would consider giving something back and soften some of their hard positions on the parking ordinances. <coughs> that they haven't speaks to their sense of entitlement and that they should have free, convenient parking spaces closer by only 300 yards, not 450 as they say, to the waves. The official policy, by the way, of the Surfrider Foundation published on their website is that reasonable use or parking fees are acceptable to their organization with certain conditions. Hopefully, we have put to rest the issue of the perceived noise disturbances not being reported by call to the police. Evidently, the police rarely responded to these calls when Preston Levin made them many years ago, so he gave up. I'm sure there's a file somewhere that contains all of our written and email communications to town officials about this problem going back more than four years. As on cue, a shrill car alarm woke us up and our slumbering guests before 6 a.m. on Labor Day Monday, proving that the problem still persists. As to the early morning beach goers' concerns about having to park in the beach lot, adding as much as 15 minutes to their Higgins Beach visit, we feel they could easily get up 15 minutes earlier in the morning. In answer to the need they cite for accessibility for some beach me, goers who are physically me, challenged. I, uh, could you please just wrap, wrap up your um, All right, I'm going to finish this time. one. Thank you. Uh, it is not difficult for someone who requires it to get a handicap placard. That can be hung from the mirror of the vehicle when needed. So I, I suggest they do that. Um, I have not spoken uh, my mind about the Surf Rider Foundation, but uh, I, I think everyone in this town understands that they are an outside agitating force, so we have to be careful with them. Thank you. 
And just a friendly reminder, folks, there is a three-minute time limit. So um, as a little stoplight up there is I green. Sorry, I thought I was going to be speaking to two issues. So. Oh, just one, <laughs> just one, three minutes. Um, so just for a friendly reminder of folks, you have three minutes at the podium. The green light is obviously go, the start of your three minutes. The yellow is the notify you of one minute, one minute warning, and the red means your time is up. Hi, my name is uh, Eric Stunkel. I'm from E. Robinson Road in Scarborough. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the uh, great changing facility parking area. Um, I utilize it 90% of the time. I think a lot of people do, especially regular surfers or anybody um, that lives in Scarborough or outside of it. Um, it's a good place to go to first if there's parking. Um, and there are occasions when I will use a short term um, if in the case of what my wife had mentioned, renting a paddleboard, whatever, sometimes you just don't um, want to carry that all the way from one end to the other. And, and in that case, it might make me seem a little lazy, but sometimes that's how much time you have. And as long as you get back to that spot within that hour time, it really shouldn't matter what you're using the spot for. Um, I'm definitely on top of it as far as um, watching the time. And I think there are a lot of people that are, but unfortunately there are some people that I think that do abuse the time um, the time limit, and I'm sure that's frustrating for a lot of people that are trying to access the beach, whether they're visitors from outside or, or people in the general Scarborough area. Um, I just wanted to just touch, I think most people pretty much said what I had planned on saying, so I just wanted to just touch on a few points. Um, first of all, I do know that the lot is free during a certain period of time, but bottom line, it, it does cost money for people to go to the lot. Um, and there are some people out there that might have just enough money to pay for the gas to drive to the beach and take their children um, and enjoy it for a short time. They may not be able to afford that $10. Maybe that parking isn't available when they go there. So by instead of having to kind of just say, well, we can't go there, they do have the one-hour spots, which is a great resource. Um, I agree, having a free spot at the beach that close, I mean, that's great. Um, but it does cost money most of the time. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're a surfer or not. It's just if you're using the beach, um, you should have some location that you can park as an alternative to the $10. Um, as far as what people have said, a lot of people have mentioned how long it takes them to walk from one spot to the other. I think it's pretty much a self-centered approach to look at it. Yeah, you have the physical ability to do that, but there's a lot of people that don't. And it does take time. Bottom line, it takes time. And it maybe, yeah, the person should get up 10 minutes earlier, but you know, it takes that extra time when you do walk from there, and, and I don't have a problem with it, and I plan accordingly, but there are, are some people that aren't able to do that, um, and I just think that needs to be said. It, it really doesn't matter if I say five minutes and the other person says three. It's just irrelevant. irrelevant. Um, as far as um, what you can say about the spots, I just want to just emphasize that I don't really think it's fair to say what the spots can be used for. I've, I've heard a lot of people say stuff about the surfing community, and I just wish that we could all kind of look at it from like an, a whole perspective, you know, whether you're a surfer, a walker, whatever. It's fair to have one hour to park, and I think that it's important that we preserve that. So please don't take away this precious resource for people. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sherry Fabre. I'm a winter renter down at Higgins Beach on 19 Ashton Street. Um, I do agree that you know the the parking spaces, the hour-long parking spaces, they shouldn't be looked at as surfing parking spaces. I mean, granted, there are times where the waves happen to be good, the surfers are enthusiastic to get in the water, and you know, the parking lot and those one-hour spaces do become full, and people do take advantage of those parking spaces. I mean, that's just, you know, what happens. But, and that's too bad. But, um, you know, uh, it, those parking spaces are for everyone, and, you know, I'm an avid surfer. I love to swim. Um, but, you know, I, I've i gone down to Higgins Beach and used those spaces for all different activities. Just because I surf doesn't mean that I'm going to be one of those people using it for two or three hours or even more. Um, so I would like as well to focus the um, the conversation back on just the, the time, the parking time. Um, it should go revert back to one hour for surfers. Okay, we, sometimes they do abuse that time, 
but for walkers, dog walkers, people with accessibility issues, um, and um, yeah, that's what I just want to say. So thank you. Hello, my name is Melissa Hoffman, uh, 56 Leland Street. I actually live in Portland. Um, I do want to express gratitude for the, the changing rooms and also actually just for this space, uh, this, the 11 spaces that are conveniently located right on the beach. Um, so just one perspective here in particular, I appreciate the gentleman earlier who um, addressed issues of finances. I would love to live on Higgins Beach, but there is a huge disparity in my socioeconomics. I'm a single parent to two children. I'm a full-time student. I attend Smith College in Western Massachusetts. Um, Money is incredibly tight. Uh, what is extremely beneficial to me, it's not so much an issue of convenience. I'm inc incredibly fit. I'm very healthy. Um, I can walk from the parking lot, but for me to have access that is free is tremendous. Last year, I did shell up the $75. Um, to have beach access, and quite honestly, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm prioritizing my finances and thinking, where can I give a little bit, where do I need to take in, and to have public be beach access that is free is incredibly valuable to me. Um, something that was addressed earlier was uh, other beaches that are public and free, and actually I, I consider myself somewhat of an expert in this because this is something I have to do to survive, essentially. Uh, Willard Beach, I can park at for free. Um, SMCC is conveniently located there, so there's a lot of spaces. There's not any surf there, unfortunately. Also, Old Orchard Beach, there are some spaces, Scarborough side, um, that you can access. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, surf going on there, generally speaking. Um, so I just wanted to speak up for, I feel like perhaps I am in a minority. You know, my assumption is that if you live at Higgins, you know, the implication is that you possess some affluence. Well, I don't possess any affluence at all. I'm a, pr a broke student with two children. And I just, I just want to reinforce the point that it's incredibly valuable for me to have one hour of free parking time. I understand there are other times I can park for free. I can come before 9. I can come after 5. I work evenings. That that creates some complications for me personally. So it's just a great resource for me, for my family as well. I'm not always showing up to surf if I want to take the kids for an hour. It's, it's a great point of excitement that we can come and I know I can access the beach for that one hour. I don't have to shell out $10 for parking and neither do I have to purchase um, the parking sticker for $75. And thank you very much, that's all I have to say. Anybody else? Please line up. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Bla Black Point Road. Um, as my sister indicated, we, we were advised by uh, a very experienced governmental attorney that it, if we, as a public body, felt as though our municipal body was, not, was acting against state law or the local charter, that a point of order could be made. In fact, I've been to a number of different meetings where the press actually stands up. Pre it's usually the press that does it. Um, so I, I would ask that the council please clarify that with your attorney. We were also advised that, <clears throat> and this is, I'm going to read directly, that any vote taken which should not have been taken due to a direct or indirect pecuniary interest is voidable under state law 30A. 2605 under voting. The vote of a body is voidable when any, this is state law, any official in an official position votes on any question in which that official has an interest, yada, yada, yada. Um, okay, so then I'll let that go. And, and I think the, the problem here is the process. I don't even know what I'm going to speak to in this public hearing right now because I think that if surf rider decides they want to take it to court, they can void your previous um, and that's why I raised the point of order. I don't know if they're going to do that. I don't know. But that was the reason I raised it. Um, I don't know if I'm talking about meters here because I hear that meters are a possibility. I don't know if I'm talking about one hour, 30 hour. I don't know what this public hearing is about, which is really difficult because I know that most of the time, second readings, you can add amendments. But typically, you chew through these things before then. And that's so that the public can have an opportunity to give you input. 
Um, Webster's Dictionary access do, is not just uh, a point of entry. It is also whether somebody can make use of something. You guys can look it up. I did. I looked it up. And 30 minutes doesn't really give you an opportunity. It does ent gives you entry, that, so it gives you half of that access, but it does not give you enough time to make use of the beach, as people have pointed out. Four times this summer, four times, I woke up and went to work at 8.30, and I was done at 2, and I wanted to meet um, my mother at the beach. At around 2 o'clock, I went down to Higgins Beach. Four times, the park was full. I paid $75 as a resident of this community, and four times I tried to use the beach, and the lot was full. I w drove down to Bayview, and guess what? Three of the four times, I found a one-hour spot. Psych. Okay, I parked. Two out of those three times, that was enough time for me because all I wanted to do was say hi to my mother, have a piece of, have a sandwich, jump in the water real quick, and then leave. And I got out of there in one hour. One of those times, I was 15 minutes late and was worried I was going to get a ticket. So I'm an advocate of giving more tickets, giving more, um, no meters, giving more tickets, perhaps using cameras if that's possible. But what I'm saying is that um, it is a decrease in access because I would not have been able to access the beach on those times if I did not have those um, spots. Did I? I think I'm done. Thank you. I am a uh, property owner at Higgins at 26 Pearl Street. My name is Holly Connolly. I'm not speaking directly to the amendment or the issues, uh, but I'd like to make a couple comments because I've heard lots of different sides, and I sort of sit on both sides of lots of dis different issues. I basically am friends with everybody at Higgins. I'm friends with a ton of the people that surf out there. I am, in general, a pretty easy-to-get-along-with person. I would just like to put on the public record a couple of items. I am also personal friends with the Levitt family, very close. I have sat on their porch numerous times for dinner, after dinner, really up until midnight. What Tom is saying he hears, he hears. And if I wasn't sitting on the porch, I couldn't speak to that, but I sit on that porch and I can. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be parking or there should be parking. I, I'm a little bit all over the map on that. But I would like to go on record saying the people that report that they live against where the parking is, even when car doors slam, I jumped on the porch a week ago because I thought something tipped over under the house. And it was just somebody parking and the door was so loud, it startled me. Um, you do hear the beep, beep, beep. It's, so I just would like to go on record that I think it's a bit um, unfair to negate people that live on the ocean front that they don't hear what they hear. They do. I've heard it myself. I don't. My house is an <coughs> ocean front. I would also like to say I've had two knee surgeries and I've been a recipient of being able to park and walk on the beach. Um, I personally think the half-hour parking makes more chaos and more coming and going but I see the logic if you think more people can use it. So I'm not really speaking one way or the other. I would just like to put a couple of these different perspectives on the public record. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charlie Fox. I'm a business owner in Portland. I actually own a surf shop. Um, I'm in business for about three years. I moved to California for eight took up surfing more out there, moved back here. I lived in a beach community out there. Everybody was surfing all the time. Things weren't really a big issue until, you know, we moved back here, and I get to want to wait last to kind of see everybody talk, see what happened, kind of feel it all out. I get in my store. I hear all these people talking about different issues, he did it about it and stuff, kind of being the person in the middle, listening to it all. Um, one, I think our parking should be there still not just for surfers, I think it should be for people bringing their dogs down. Um, family members bring kids, people bringing their family and want to enjoy the beach for a little bit. Um, I think that's crucial. You know, we live in a beautiful state, we have a beautiful area, we have a very short time of summer. For Portland residents and surrounding Portland residents, it's a great access area for people to go to. 
I see a lot of kids go down there in the summertime and a lot of parents bringing their young ones down. I used to be brought there by my parents when I was a little child also. Um, I'm a dog owner. I think it's great to have the access to bring your dog down there. I just recently moved to Higgins for the winter with my fiance and our dog. Um, before, I used to drive down there, park in our parking lot, let my dog run free on the beach for a little bit, and then go to work. I think it's awesome to have the hour parking lot space because then you can go do your thing, get to all the energy right out of your dog, and go back. You can do the same thing with your kid. Um, you know, <laughs> so with that said, hour parking is crucial. For the thing, I think we need to stop playing the blame game on each other right now, the whole surfers blaming each other and the other thing. It's getting a little heated. It's getting a little kind of childish, to tell you the truth. Um, and realistically, I think we need to start working more together on ideas of what can resolve. If we can work together on it all, then I think we can resolve it. But if we're going to continue fighting with each other, nothing's going to get resolved and then it's just going to get more heated. Um, with that said, um, I just hope we can just all resolve this. I appreciate you guys, since I moved back here to Maine, having the beautiful parking lot back there. I used to remember the older parking lot back in the day. I appreciate the new parking lot. I really appreciate the bathhouse. I use it all the time. I park back there. When we do surf lessons, we tell our people who are in part taking the surf lesson to park back there. Our employees park back there, and we utilize all the showers and then the bathhouse also. I think it's an amazing opportunity to be, have something like that for us in this community. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Hey there, I'm Melissa Gates. I'm with Surfrider Foundation. I feel like so many people have talked about Surfrider tonight that I don't need to, but since there were a couple of false statements made, um, I guess I needed to speak. Um, so I do want to start out by echoing some comments that other folks made, um, expressing gratitude to this council for your incredible energy that you've sunk into this, not just this time around, but I know, Jessica, you've been involved in this for many years, and I know it's a tenuous issue. It's divisive in the town, and that's really unfortunate. Um, so thank you for your work on this. Um, I do want to clarify that Surfrider Foundation isn't just surfers. We're beach users. We're non-consumptive, low-impact beach users. And we're not from away. We're from right here. We're a grassroots organization. We have a headquartered office in California, but we have chapters in coastal communities all over the United States, 85 of them, actually, and 40 youth clubs. They work on issues right in their backyard. In here, if we did a showing of hands of how many people are Surfrider members and Scarborough residents, I can tell you I can see at least five. So we're not from away, we are from right here in Maine, I live in Maine as well. And we're working on coastal issues right here in Maine, including beach access. Um, so today I'm urging you on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation Maine chapter, all of our members and supporters, including the 419 Scarborough residents who signed a petition calling upon you to reject without exception or amendment the two proposed ordinances that came before you on September 2nd. Um, really now the discussion has moved to this 30 minute uh, parking proposal and I'm urging you to vote against that. Changing the Bayview Avenue parking to 30 minutes is only going to exacerbate any noise issues that we've heard from a bunch of residents at Higgins Beach are problematic for them as homeowners. When we decrease the amount of parking, that increases the amount of traffic. It's kind of a no-brainer. There's going to be more noise, more complaints, and that's a fact. I think that's a good enough reason to squash that proposal in itself. Um, instead, I really hope the council will support Councillor St. Clair's, um, what she said she was going to announce um, is a, moving it back to one hour parking. And if consistency really is an issue, um, then instead of making Higgins Beach Bayview Avenue parking 30 minutes, making the other parking one hour. One hour parking really is short term use at a beach. As evidenced in public comments on September 2nd and tonight, a lot of folks have mobility issues and they can't qualify for the parking permits or it's a matter of integrity. They don't want to go for the handicapped parking permit, but they need that beach adjacent parking. These users have a hard time as it is using the beach adjacent parking spaces on Bayview for their short term use within that one hour time frame. But they do and they, they do use it in the hour time frame. So do surfers. 
And really, this is not about convenience. It's about access. An hour is tight for many types of users, but people, again, they can and they do use those spots within that hour time frame. If it's really about enforcing that one hour parking, then I would highly recommend that you guys consider looking at something that Councillor Holbrook brought up at the last meeting, which is utilizing that existing video surveillance. That way folks that, who are residents who are seeing people breaking the law or seeing naked people streaking or whatever they're seeing can actually call the PD and say, hey, at 6 15 a.m. on this date, I saw this illegal infraction. The PD can then double check okay, that. Out of time, please. Sure, thank you for calling that to my attention. I didn't see the blinking red light. Um, also, we'll just double back on what Sue said, that Maine State Law 30-A, Section 2651, does void your previous vote um, because Councillor Donovan has recused sure. himself, and that uh, can well, actually... you are out of time. Sure. Thank you, thank you again for noting that, and thank you for um, allowing me to comment this evening. Much appreciated. Does anybody else wish to speak? And saying none, I will close the public hearing. I would like to move that we have a five-minute recess before we take up our next agenda item. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. We have time to do a coffee run. <laughs> You're not going to hear.
Thank you and for waiting and welcome back. So on to our the rest of our business for this evening and we are on order number 15-073, which is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new renewal request for the junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A, MRSA, Chapter 183. Can we have the doors closed? I know. Thank you. Finally. Quiet back down there. Thank you. Thank you. So, order number 15-073 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the renewal quest for the junkyard permits pursuant to Title 30A, MRSA, Chapter 183, Goldstein Steel Company, Inc., located at 36 Running Hill Road, A. Gagnon, or E. Perry Iron and Metal, located at Rigby Road, Scarborough Auto Parts, located at 40 Holmes Road, and Speedway Auto, located at 343 Payne Road. Again, this is a 7 p.m. public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And this is also for an action, so is there a motion? Move approval. Second. And is, uh, Tom, if, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of, there are no outstanding issues. No, there aren't. Uh, the clerk has certified that there are not. I also have reports from the code office who's inspected all, uh, all facilities and uh, reports that everything's in order. Thank you, Tom. Is there any discussion? And seeing none, all those in favor, and that is unanimous. Item number, on to our next item, which is order number 15-074, is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Jason Mellison, doing business as Adjacent Bakery, located at 5 Lincoln Avenue. Again, this is a public hearing. Does anybody wish to speak on this item? And saying none, I will close the public hearing. And pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. <laughs> <laughs> and discussion. I'll just add, welcome, welcome to Scarborough. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Old business, there is none at this time. New business is order number 15-075, first reading and schedule a public hearing, and a second reading on the proposed amendments of Chapter 1301, the General Assistance Ordinance, pursuant to Title 22, MRSA 4305. Is there anybody that wishes to speak on this item? And saying none, I will close comment. And Tom, if you would, just bring us up to speed yes. because this is another one of those this is lovely... the annual ritual. Um, mm. uh, local governments are... Uh, well, I should say general assistance is relegated to local governments for administration, though the state dictates uh, the maximums and essentially dictates everything about the program. So this is really a, an annual process. Uh, frankly, you don't have any control over this. Um, and it does update all the maximums uh, relative to different types and levels of general assistance. Thank you, Tom. Any discussion? Oh, <laughs> thank you, Tony. <laughs> Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. And any discussion? I failed to mention, just as an interesting point, um, we now receive 70% 70, 70 re reimbursement from the state for all funds that are administered through these programs, that's up from 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't make a huge fiscal impact, but I thought it was worth noting that we actually will be getting more from the state uh, for this program. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mm -mm. All right. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. So now we have our next item, which is a non-action item. As you will recall, earlier in the meeting, we did have an adjustment to the agenda. At this time, I'd like to invite our Police Chief, Mr. Moulton, up to give us a presentation on a new program called Operation Hope, if I'm reading my chicken scratching right. <laughs> I have my three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Start. Go. <laughs> I'll be very brief, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Officer Gill and, and our crime analyst, Jamie Higgins. Um, just want to thank you for the opportunity to brief you on, on what I think will be a very positive initiative for the, for the department. I don't think it's any surprise to anybody that, uh, that we have a very serious heroin and opioid uh, epidemic throughout New England and unfortunately reaching into... Uh, our own community in the greater Portland area. 
um, people throughout the area have been dying at alarming rates, and even though we do not have the numbers that some, some places do, in 2015 we have had one confirmed uh, overdose death, and we've, had, uh, we've deployed Narcan on 10 occasions to bring someone back from near certain death on those. Um, we also recognize that as much as 85% of our crime has a connection to drugs and addiction. Um, I, I just think it's really important, I can't stress enough that we really need to, to think about the face of addiction and, and um, how it's changed and this is no longer about uh, some gang member in a back alley or something. This is, it pervades all walks of life and socioeconomic status. Addiction is a disease and we really need to, to recognize it as such. It's a true public health problem. We recognize that our enforcement efforts are important and we will continue to uh, pursue those, but there, there needs to be some way to give hope to folks that are uh, trapped in this vicious cycle of addiction. So knowing all that and, and seeing what's going on in not only in our community but across the state and, and throughout New England, um, I'm very proud to say that Officer John Gill and, and our crime analyst Jamie Higgins recognize this need and through their research and efforts brought forth a program that I feel will make a difference and I would like to have them come forward and provide you with a brief overview of Operation Hope. I'm John Gill, I'm a patrol officer here in Scarborough. And Jamie Higgins is our crime analyst and our social media outreach person. She's going to be passing out some flyers that will be part of this program that we're implementing. Effective August, October 1st, the Scarborough Police Department is going to implement Operation HOPE. It's the heroin opiate prevention effort. The purpose of this is to address, to address the demand portion of the heroin and opiate abuse problem by recognizing the human element involved and encouraging users to seek help and helping advocate for recovery. Some of the motivation behind this is we've seen obviously an increase in the heroin and opiate abuse rates throughout the state of Maine. Between 2011 and 2014, heroin-related overdoses increased by 714%. Mm -hmm. There's been a 380% increase in the number of fentanyl-related deaths. Fentanyl is another form of an opioid that sometimes heroin users find in their heroin or use independently. As the chief mentioned, our best estimates are about 80-85% of the crimes we deal with on a daily basis, whether they be home, vehicle, residential, commercial, burglaries, thefts, uh, robberies, those sorts of crime are driven by opiate addiction. There's one retailer in town here who alone, we've had 118 calls for service so far this year for theft. And when you go on those calls and you see the suspects that you're dealing with, a lot of the times it's clear they're suffering from addiction. Traditionally, our focus has been on the enforcement end, and that's very appropriate that that continue. Access to facilities here in Maine for people to receive treatment are on the decrease daily. Mm. And we as police officers traditionally are not aware of what is out there in terms of access to facilities so we can give people suffering addiction advice on what they might want to do. So this program is based on the premise that our officers go out and interact with people suffering from addiction, whether it be uh, at an overdose scene, a domestic violence incident, uh, mental health related calls, vehicle stops, and we can use those contacts to help encourage people to get help and show them that people do care about them and there's a way out. We're doing this in concert with two key partners. The Portland Recovery Community Center is a Portland-based nonprofit organization which serves as a safe haven for those in recovery. It offers a recovery coach program, telephone recovery support services, recovery program meetings, various support groups, employment and housing service, among other services. We're also partnering with an organization called the Police Assisted Addiction Recovery Initiative, or PARI. PARI is a Massachusetts-based nonprofit. It was founded in July of this year. Its mission is to promote these sorts of programs, not only in Massachusetts, but throughout the country. It was founded by Chief Lenny Campanello, 
of the Gloucester, Massachusetts Police Department. And if you follow the media, you know that they've had great success implementing a program there. As of last week, they've put 158 people into recovery in a four-month period. Mm. Having said that, we realize we're not Massachusetts. They have a larger availability of treatment facilities. They have greater access to care. And they have a broader insurance availability for people who might be suffering from addiction. So consisting of five elements is what we're going to try to do. There's an officer education law enforcement training piece. Starting next week, we're having folks from the recovery center in Portland come in to provide our officers training on addiction. Too often when we see somebody that's suffering from addiction, they're in the back of a police cruiser with handcuffs on. And to be perfectly honest with you, when someone is a heroin user, feeding a habit, the kinds of things that they get up to and do aren't the kind of things that make them real likable. Mm -hmm. So we think it's important that our officers see what's possible with recovery, that that person sitting in the back of their cruiser is not the person that's really they're capable of being. Public education and outreach. When our officers respond to a call where they think opiate or heroin addiction might be part of the problem, they're going to provide a flyer similar to the one you have in front of you. If the person's committed a crime, like the chief said, they're still going to go to jail, but they're going to go to jail with a flyer telling them, you know, somebody cares about you, and when you're ready for help and you get out, you can come and ask for that help. Jamie's going to use our social media presence to spread the word of the program and let people know what we're willing to do. And we also look for other opportunities to foster public dialogue and discussion about this problem in the state of Maine as a launching point for maybe some real uh, help coming. We're going to have a drug turn-in component of this program where if somebody's addicted to opiates or heroin, they can come into the police department and turn in their heroin, their opiates, their needles, whatever they have, without fear of arrest or being charged. They can ask us for help, and we're going to engage in treatment assistance. Anybody that comes in and asks us for help are going to be screened by a police officer, make sure they're eligible to participate in the program, and then they'll be paired with an angel who will come in, a volunteer who's been trained in not only addiction, but also in providing support under this program. That angel will help walk them through a detox and rehabilitation process to include accelerated placement in a PARI-related rehabilitation treatment program whenever possible. We realize that's not always going to be possible, and that's going to be one of our challenges. But if we can get one person into treatment, and save one life, that's better than what's happening now. Finally, treatment follow-up. The folks at the Portland Recovery Center have agreed that once somebody has gone through that process and they're on the road to recovery and they know recovery, they can continue their relationship with them. And there's lots of great programs there to help out a lot of people. What this program is not, it's not a solution to the heroin and opiate problem here in the state of Maine. Obviously, as the chief says, we're facing a public health crisis, and our first responders find themselves on the front line with little resources and little practical support beyond putting a quick fix on a problem that day. If we're going to be waiting for someone to come along and take care of this problem, we could be waiting a long time, and people are literally dying in this state. So we want to use what limited resources we have to kind of serve as a stopgap measure until real reform and real solutions come along. It's not a get out of jail free program. If you commit a crime, regardless if you're on heroin or opiates, you're going to be held accountable by our criminal justice system. Like I mentioned before though, the difference is there will be a message that goes along with you that when you're ready for real help, let us know and we'll help you get there. It's also important to note that this program is not funded by taxpayer dollars. Much of the work that's been done has been done on our own private time. Uh, there'll be a significant volunteer component to this in terms of our angels. And our partners, both at PARI and the Portland Recovery Center, have invested heavily in trying to assist us launch this program. In recent weeks, we've built those partnerships. We've engaged in a dialogue with members of the addiction and recovery community. We've devised protocols and processes to implement the program and we've explored the availability of potential treatment providers. In coming days, we'll be conducting training of our police officers and the initial cadre of volunteer angels. 
We continue to explore additional partnerships with other entities, such as medical transport firms, our EMS providers, media outlets, treatment centers, and the sober living facility. We hope that additional support, assistance, and partnerships will be forthcoming now that we've gone public with our intent to implement this program on October 1st. We admittedly face many challenges in implementing this program, and there's no guarantee of success. Nevertheless, our agency, our chief, and our police officers, and our partners at the PRCC and PARI are intent on helping means, change Maine's response to addiction. We hope to help foster a public dialogue and discussion about addiction and help find ways to move forward, seek solutions, and work with our partners to give a face to recovery to show what is possible and to hopefully save lives. Thank you. Well, um, I, I'm sure um, some of the other counselors might like to have a comment, um, but if you're, are you done with your presentation? I don't want to cut you off. <laughs> uh, I think I would love to just offer a quick, uh, maybe a long comment. Um, I do want to thank you. I, I do um, recall, I, you know, hearing um, about you presenting this, uh, this thought to Tom and, and, and um, coming, you know, coming to the council. And I, I think this is a, a phenomenal program. And I really want to just applaud you guys for, for taking the time to, you know, you know, always thinking outside of the box and trying to think of another way to address a problem. And like you said, even if it's one life and one person that you can affect, um, certainly that that's huge. Um, and I think it's well well worth it. And I, I just want to again thank thank the time and commitment and devotion of your volunteers that are willing to participate in this. Um, I, I think this is a really great approach. Um, I did hear with interest about the new Gloucester and in some mm -hmm. of the success in there. And um, I remember thinking at the time that that was a, a very out of the box idea and, and a good way to try to maybe make a make a change. And um, so, again, I just want to thank you for, for bringing to this to us. It's a great concept. It's a great idea. Um, I hope, well, I hope in some ways it's, su it's successful, and in other ways I hope maybe it's not successful because maybe we don't have that much. It would be nice to think that. But um, at any rate, is there any other counselors that maybe might like to see Marie? Um, I also would like to thank you. When I heard that you were considering this program, I was w right on board <laughs> right away. Um, I have family members who have been addicted to various substances. Uh, I know the hell that that is. I know from my own personal point of view, I am um, very concerned about the lack of treatment opportunities in this state, but I'm hoping as law enforcement officials get more and more involved with programs like this, a message will get sent to those who need to hear it that it's not just a hammer, you also got to hold out a hand uh, to people to try to help them get off, particularly heroin and, and fentanyl addictions. It's like, you know, that that's such a quick addiction uh, that most people don't realize, and it's deadly, potentially deadly. And as Jessica said, if we can save just one life, to me it would be worth it. So I congratulate you on bringing this to Scarborough, and I'm very proud that we're going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter and then... Sure. Yeah, just, just a short comment, kind of echo everything other counselors have said, but also I just want to thank you for your leadership, whether it's on this or what you're attempting to do on social media and your Facebook page. You're really trying to reach out to our community and be part of our community and try to engage people in different ways, just not enforcement. So thanks for the leadership. It's just a great model. Thanks. John. I'm all set, actually. Everything's already been said. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks much, and keep you know. us. Keep us. <laughs> I think we all are enthusi We're all enthusiastic, and we'd like to be kept informed of of how it goes, yeah. because mm. it's it's something that we'd like to be able to have the community know about. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Our next item is item number nine: standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. We'll start down on your end, Sean. Absolutely. Actually. Uh, one of the things that I want to start doing is actually, I'm actually going to try to provide a handout because there's so much work that the Finance Committee is actually working on, as well as a few other things that I participate in, so it keeps me kind of uh, um, online. So at least uh, to start off with uh, regarding finance, um, there's really been um, categorized, my report covers uh, three areas. First is we did receive the un um, unaudited uh, fiscal year-end uh, financial reports in draft format. 
Um, they're actually um, pending year-end adjustments for accruals and other post-year-end activities, so they're not official yet. Um, uh, the best that I can uh, suggest at this time, uh, somewhat of a personal opinion, is that the fiscal direction remains strong and positive. And what we saw, and I think that uh, we're beating conservative projections that we might have been concerned with, um, and we probably will be posting positive surplus balances for the year end. So uh, Tom and Ruth and everyone has done an incredible job, as well as the school department, because there was some um, nice information in there regarding uh, them as well. So uh, we'll obviously be able to provide more information when that becomes official. Um, I want to categorize the other two items really about initiatives that are moving forward and then initiatives that are still under review. Um, we will be forwarding, uh, we did approve what is called the rescinding bond orders. These are orders that have been um, previously approved for funding in our capital um, expenditure projects and programs uh, budget that have not been um, actually bonded or completed or did not need the money that was requested. Um, that will be coming to you for approval uh, so that that money can be released. It's more of a clerical administrative function. It doesn't necessarily have an impact to our financial um, it has a little bit because it gets reported, so it might have some, but um, it's not, um, I think it was about $4.3 million in total. Is that about right, Tom? Yes. So it's uh, significant, and it's um, nice to see that we're on top of that. I um, also want to report that um, we are moving forward with an RFP process for auditing services. We are a little bit of, uh, ahead of schedule, which is really good because uh, we do have our um, auditors already selected for the next year, so this is really for the following year. Um, and we are doing that in accordance with both charter and our own policies. And then um, we are um, beginning an evaluation and review of our legal services. What I would like to suggest is that um, the Finance Committee is recommending that we have a, uh, we did receive an evaluation from our current uh, legal uh, counsel. Um, and I, I uh, do apologize, I did not provide that, but I'll make sure if Tom can provide that to you so you can read that, because it does provide some activity detail around what has been expended, uh, some services that have been provided. What we would like to do is schedule a meeting um, that may need to be an executive session because we are talking about a performance uh, standard um, and to invite that as an open discussion with other councils, but at the very least making sure that the chairperson um, is present because um, that person is more, um, works very closely with the manager when those type of issues may come up. So we would like to have that person, um, Councillor Holbrook, as part of that conversation. Um, initiatives that are under review that will be coming forward. Um, we are actually one of the very few communities that are beginning to look at what is called a capital planning policy. That is about how we actually plan our capital projects and how we fund those and the terms and the conditions in which we bond those. Um, that is in draft format. We'll be taking that up at the next meeting if you're interested. Uh, uh, please talk to us. Um, there is also, and I'll pass this out uh, to you now, and this is uh, information only at this point, and I'll explain why. And I brought this up in the past. Um, I have presented to the Finance Committee for consideration at a later time a proposal for a budget process improvement workshop and facilitation by an outside consultant. Um, what you're receiving today as a document, again, not only is um, informational, it's really a baseline for us to at least initiate the conversation. Um, and that conversation has to be a partnership with our school board colleagues um, so that we can identify um, w you know, how we did what we did, why there were parts that were obviously very successful, um, there were parts that were very challenging, and then there's some parts that may not have worked necessarily as we expected. Um, at this point, um, because of time constraints, we could not have a joint meeting with the Finance Committee of the School Board, which is where I'd like to have this actually originate and get consensus to move it forward to each of our boards. Um, we're hoping to have that in the near future. But I, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, uh, give me a call. I'd love to answer those questions, but again, this is in um, draft format. Last, um, the last two items, um, and I'll clarify that last one because I obviously didn't complete it, but um, we are waiting, the Finance Committee is waiting for a charitable contributions policy that the Rules and Policy Committee is responsible for drafting um, or redrafting so that we do have, I believe, $74,000. Is that right, Tom? We have, we have some money that needs to be allocated. Uh, whatever the 60 is the number six in my mind. But. So we need that policy in order to give direction to the finance director mm -hmm. about those charitable organizations because they are calling and asking what can they expense. So we do need to get on that as well. And uh, the last item um, is incomplete in what, what I put there, and I forgot that formal title, but really what this item is is that there will be um, a request coming forward from the finance committee on bonds that have been approved and funded However, there's excess funding because the cost came in under budget. So there needs to be a decision of the council 
on what to do with that funding, whether it's to apply it to um, other capital projects that is permissible or whether to apply it to debt service. Um, so we need to have that conversation and that will be coming forward from the manager as well. And um, so th that's the finance. If I, it's okay with the chair, when I can cover three more items for different committees. Uh, SEDCO has their general board meeting tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. Um, they're finally, they are back out of the uh, summer sessions, um, summer break, and so we're getting back to work. Um, they will be making their annual award announcements uh, here pretty soon um, for our uh, business community. The annual meeting of SEDCO is October 6th, and it's at the Black Point Inn from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. As counselors, we, of course, are um, invited to attend, as well as any business that's within Scarborough um, is also invited, and they should contact uh, Scarborough Economic Development about the uh, um, how they can sign up as well as maybe even become a sponsor. And I did want to uh, mention on behalf of Karen Martin, our executive director, um, that there is some exciting news about new business openings and particularly some open houses. I uh, wanted to send out a congratulations to On the Vine Market that's up at uh, Dunstan. Uh, Northeast Civil Solutions will have an open house uh, for invitees on Friday and then the Salt Pump Climbing Gym that's in the Higgis Parkway. Um, has a grand opening on Saturday that is actually open to the entire public, and everyone is welcome to attend. Um, my eco main um, or my eco main uh, uh, work on the board tomorrow is their uh, first meeting after the summer as well, starting at they have like three meetings, 3 p.m. and I think 4 p.m. is the other one. Um, one of the things that I do want to start doing is actually forward you some of the operational reports because I think it provides a lot of detailed information about its success over the last 10 years in particular, but most importantly, where it's going and some of the constraints that we're going to be faced as a partnership or a uh, community partnership uh, because of uh, recyclable costs, power generation costs, and other things. So I think you need to have that. And last, even though it's not official, um, um, kind of an assignment, but um, I am actually, I have been elected or appointed by the county commissioners to serve on the budget advisory committee that starts tomorrow. So uh, any of you who have interests and concerns with our county budget, um, this is a chance for you to, if you can get in touch with me, as well as citizens, um, I'd like to hear what you have um, so that I can take that to the table. And that is, starts tomorrow. So thank you. Uh, good segue uh, from uh, Sean's report. The Rules Committee is uh, scheduled to meet next Wednesday, 4 p.m. The agenda uh, is to take up the allocation rules for charitable giving so that we can move that forward. Uh, I believe we have a representative from United Way uh, who is going to speak to us to give us a sense of how they do it, uh, and they're obviously successful and, and, and substantial. And, uh, and I'm going to be also working on trying to identify what came out of our last meeting uh, as to uh, the direction we're heading. The other item on the agenda is the Senior Property Tax Relief Program. Uh, we are going to try to decouple ourselves from the state because the state's program has demonstrated that it's neither stable nor adequate for the needs of Scarborough residents. Uh, we've been working with the assessor's office and the town manager on this. Uh, Craig Friedrich and myself uh, who've collaborated and Craig's been invaluable as a tax expert, tax attorney. Uh, so uh, it's ready for prime time and we'll, uh, we'll be unveiling this and hopefully getting it to the council within the next month or, or so. Hey Marie. Uh, yes, I am pleased to announce that Scarborough has joined what's called the Next Century Cities which is um, a nationwide uh, effort to expand broadband and the universal access to, to internet. Um, basically, the principles are high-speed internet is necessary infrastructure. Internet is nonpartisan. Communities must enjoy self-determination. High-speed internet is a community-wide endeavor. Um, meaningful competition drives progress, co and collaboration benefits all. And a part of it, uh, we got Tom and Karen Martin and I got an email. We're included on an email. I, I think it's from Senator King's office. I haven't had a chance to, uh, from Travis Kennedy. Um, basically inviting us, we're going to be going to a conference on, I think it's September 28th. I'm thinking off the top of my head here. Uh, here in Portland, and I believe we're one of only four communities in Maine right now that officially belong to this. 
doesn't cost the taxpayers anything, so don't worry about cost. Um, but it will um, get us more focused on expanding broadband and see what the opportunities are for all of the citizens of Scarborough because, as people may or may not be aware, the three-ring binder runs through Scarborough. And the town is connected to it. I'd like to see everybody connected to it with high, higher speed internet. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, Conservation Commission, we met Monday. We talked about uh, a program on called something to do with community ratings, which I'm going to follow up uh, with with Manager Hall. Um, the beach profiling program, which measures the sand increase and decrease in the literal profiles of beaches in town and making sure that we're keeping up with that. Um, we had heard, and I, I'm hoping to address it, that there was a school group. Um, <laughs> There's a school group from the middle school that was doing it one of the teachers, and they may or may not be continuing it, and I hope they do because I think it's fabulous uh, for hands-on science uh, for kids. Um, we also are going, one of our goals for the next year is going to be what we, we call, this is a scientific wordy, resiliency planning, which basically is looking at how can uh, the town of Scarborough be prepared with eventual rise of sea levels that's been occurring um, on how, how do we protect our infrastructure. We have a lot of uh, things in town. It's not just buildings, it's roads and the railroad and all sorts of different things that uh, could be subject to the rise in sea level. And I'm not saying tomorrow, this is long term, this is planning ahead. How do we plan ahead for this sort of thing? Um, and then last but not least, long-range planning, Matt, we talked about um, the small batch processing and food processing, I can't even say that, um, down in the Haggis Parkway. Um, Higgins Beach had a very successful, um, what they call a charrette, which is where they had a community meeting to talk about potential mm -hmm. zoning changes that make sense for that community. Um, we talked about multifamily housing and what will it look like in the future in in Scarborough, and then also uh, we're working on facilities master planning for the town of Scarborough, and that's it for me. Thank you, Jim Murray. Um, Housing Alliance has a meeting tomorrow evening. Um, one of the items of, or the main item of discussion, will be um, pertaining to, as you recall, we have the Habitat Project, and some of those were, you know, Alliance or Scarborough homes. So they're just kind of finalizing up some of the review criteria of how an applicant would go forward for that. Um, so again, that meeting is for the Housing Alliance at 6:30 p.m. tomorrow evening. Um, Appointments did meet this evening. We have some names to post. For Coastal Waters and Harbor Advisory Committee, a first alternate position for Moriah Erickson with a term to expire in 2017. And for Senior Advisory Committee, you have Nicole Fish as a full voting member and Carol Rancourt as a first, um, I'm sorry, as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2017. My notes. Thank you, Tony. And also, I do want to touch base on historic preservation. Um, historic preservation is now, as you recall, a standing committee. Um, so they're starting to get their feet wet and, and lining up. And, and um, one of the interesting things was, um, and as it was just touched on earlier, um, at their last meeting, we had a guest speaker, which was Mr. Larry of. Um, kind of the Millican Tavern, if you will, um, which is the last brick property, which really kind of shed some great light on um, some kind of unique things when it comes to single homes. And um, it was a, we had a, from that conversation, we went back and sat down with our town planner, Dan Bacon, um, Craig Frederick, the chair, and myself, and, and just kind of picked his brain a little bit where you, you had such great work over the summer in Higgins Beach dealing with some of some of the same commonalities. You have houses that are maybe not quite conforming and you know, constantly needing to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and, and those sorts of things. And there were some commonalities there. Um, so it really offered some great insight. Um, we're going to be taking that information back to the Historic Preservation to, to speak about. Um, and so their next meeting will be Tuesday, October 6th, which is the first Tuesday in the month at 6.30 p.m. And again, um, they'll just be discussing some of the great ideas and, and, and some of the thoughts that came from that. 
Um, and that's it for committees for me. Uh, Councilor Blaise. Uh, yesterday we had a uh, ordinance committee meeting, and the only thing that we really discussed is uh, fireworks in town. Uh, the town had received a number of complaints during this past fourth of July. <coughs> Uh, we kind of determined that there wasn't anything that we wanted to really attack or, or change, uh, but we did want to ensure that it was clear communication as to the ordinance uh, where uh, fireworks are allowed and the communication of that information back to people is accurate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, just two quick updates. Uh, the Shellfish Committee met, and actually I reported last time that they had filed as interveners in some of the expansions and, and renewals of lease for some of the oyster farming that's going on in the river. The good news is that it really was some miscommunication that had taken place. They actually sat down and talked to each other at the last committee meeting. They've, they've all kind of gotten to a good place, so that, that was great to see. Then the second thing on the seniors committee, which was uh, great to hear the confirmation of some of the new committee members tonight, that's great. They also, they, they're meeting really, they're starting to focus on how can they sort of broaden their appeal and membership. They're looking at, they have a lot of activities that are geared toward maybe some of the older seniors and they're starting to look at a lot of some of the younger seniors are really still interested in a lot of physical activities. So they're starting to think about what that offering might look like. So it was a very productive meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, town Manager Report. Yes, thank you. I, I won't take much time, but I thought I would devote this evening just to give an update on construction projects. This time of year in Maine, we're furiously trying to get things done and buttoned up for what's to come in a couple short months, I'm sure. So I'm going to kind of go rapid fire through this, and I'm certainly pleased to, to drop back and provide more detail if you like. Uh, the Pleasant Hill Road Project, Phase 2, uh, is really finally complete. The final wearing course is down. I, I suspect there'll be some final cleanup with, uh, you know, behind the curb, if you will, landscaping and uh, making sure seed takes and whatnot and final paint. But uh, for all intents and purposes, that project is, is done. I appreciate the patient, patience of uh, town residents. It's been uh, two full years of construction, complete re reconstruction of that road, uh, but the final product, I think, was worth, uh, worth that aggravation. Uh, DOT's project up on 114 in Running Hill. For those of you that have been up there, they've provided uh, an additional uh, left turn lane for those coming uh, towards Scarborough and wanting to go left on Running Hill Road and done some additional widening on either side of the intersection. Uh, the town actually piggybacked a bit and did some additional paving beyond the scope mm -hmm. of that project. And uh, again, that's uh, virtually complete. There'll be some final cleanup with landscaping and paint. Uh, we have done some improvements to the intersection at Payne Road and Holmes Road, created a left turn lane. Uh, I will mention that the signal work, uh, the loops in the road, that has to be uh, still completed. So um, bear, uh, the uh, binder course is down, but there'll be final paving and additional signal work. So right now timing is not um, working very well. In fact, it's uh, just on a, a simple cycle. So for those of you that are looking for immediate improvements, you won't see it until we get the signals all coordinated. Uh, but that will be done certainly uh, this fall. The Broad Turn Road Sewer Extension Project, uh, Councillor Holbrook mentioned the Habitat Project. This brings sewer up from the existing pump station in Broad Turn Road uh, up to the site. Uh, that work will start this coming Monday on the 21st. Um, they have a full month to complete, but we've been assured once they commit, there will be about two weeks in the heavy construction, if you will. Uh, and I'll have to drive through that to and from my home, so I'll report personally how that's going. <laughs> um, moving along quickly here, uh, we have moved forward with uh, preliminary engineering work on Route 114 reconstruction. This is that section from Maple Avenue. Uh, to eight corners, crossing the Nunsuch. That's an area that's heavily traveled, uh, very narrow roads, open ditches. Um, so we'll be uh, having a better sense in a few months of what that design will look like. And you'll see it come around through your CIP process. And lastly, we've been made aware from DOT that they intend to remove the overhead flasher at Beechridge Road and 
Holmes Road and in its place put uh, LED lighted uh, stop signs, which is uh, the new approach that the DOT has adopted. Uh, we're working with them now to, the, the initial proposal was oversized stop signs and two on every approach, so a total of eight oversized stop signs with LED lights. <laughs> Seems to be a bit of overkill, so Angela Blanchett, our town engineer, has been working with her colleagues at DOT uh, to make sure that uh, we get the proper effect, but uh, we, we also don't uh, light up the night, so to speak. So. <laughs> I'm thinking of the poor two houses on yeah, the corner there, that are... There are two houses very close <laughs> to the intersection, so nice we're mindful of that. <laughs> uh, that project is uh, being bid as we speak, mm -hmm. and it's, there's nearly no construction activity associated, so it will be completed this fall. We'll continue to monitor it. Mm -hmm. And lastly, though I don't know uh, Ms. Emily Robbins, she's a Scarborough resident. Uh, she made us aware. She's a Scarborough graduate. She is uh, a contestant for the 2016 Miss Maine pageant. Uh, I read her bio, and she sounds like a lovely young lady. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it, uh, one, because she's one of our own, uh, and she's also looking for support and sponsorship. So I'm sure anyone who's interested could find her um, um, online uh, should, they, should they be interested. So that's it for this evening. Thank you, Tom. So next item, which is item number 11, council member comments. We'll start on the other end with Peter. Yeah, I guess I, I don't have much tonight, but I, but I think I do have a request of both the chair and the town manager that based on the public comment we heard tonight and some challenges whether we are in compliance or not in compliance with state law as it relates to the public hearing tonight, I'd like to have some type of response to that. I, wonder, I want to better understand what that was about and whether there's any issues there for us as a council. Could I just ask for clarification? I just yeah. want to make sure I get you the answer you're looking for. Are, is, is your question whether a point of order could be raised by a member of the public? Or no, is the, my, my, my question was we, we, the accusations were made or it was stated that we are not in compliance with state law. 30-A is what was referenced, which means nothing to me, but I'm sure it does to someone else. Um, I think just because it's been raised from the floor, from our constituents, that we need to have a response. And I think, as I understood the challenge, which I'm not, I understood the challenge to be because there was a recusal that the first read may or may not be valid. And I think we need to at least address that issue because it was raised twice. Thanks for the clarity. Yeah, I mean, I did pursue that issue yeah. to some extent with the town attorney. Uh, I don't have anything in writing, I, um, and perhaps I should uh, hold my comment and, and have him commit his comments in writing, and I will certainly do that. I, mean, I, just, I think that's just due diligence on our part because it was we were, we were asked the question twice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and? I'd just like to make a comment about uh, the Pleasant Hill Road project going two years. Even though it went two years and they did major, major changes to it, there were very, very few times where there was much of a, uh, an interruption in traffic. The traffic flowed very, very well. I thought the job was done extremely. I thought I passed that along to Seth. Jim Um Yeah, I just have a, a couple of comments, and I, I'll be frank. Uh, I am not at all amused by the ad hominem attacks that have been taking place in this town, uh, particularly against my fellow counselors, or counselor in particular. Um, I find it distasteful. I, I absolutely think it's your First Amendment right to do that sort of thing, but I'll tell you right now that uh, you're eroding your arguments as far as I'm concerned. The first thing I have ever learned in... Uh, debating or in any type of uh, political um, things I've been involved with is the minute you devolve to ad hominem attacks <clears throat> and you aren't addressing the issues directly, then um, I guess you don't have a very good argument. Um, and that's um, my opinion, but I, I want to get it out there. I'm also uh, very um, disappointed by what I saw as I felt, again, this is my opinion, disruptive behavior uh, in, in this public hearing. Um, it feels like it's bullying behavior to me. That when some people come up here and they sit there 
and they make mm, veiled or even unveiled threats, if you want to say, about legal action over something that doesn't even need to get to this level, I find it quite disturbing. And then I will leave with just this one comment, and I, I'm just going to say that people who live in glass houses should not be lobbing rocks, and um, I, I would hope that uh, any counselors uh, who live in glass houses would uh, recognize they do so. And that's it. Bill? Uh, again, the uh, uh, rezoning at Higgins Beach uh, uh, different than the matter that we talked about today. This is really a, 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 a test case to see if this unique form of zoning uh, could help uh, resolve zoning issues that I think exist at all three of our beaches uh, because of the historical nature of those uh, beaches and structures. So uh, <clears throat> we had this charrette, which was a whole series of meetings over three days this summer. Then <clears throat> the uh, planning team came back uh, several weeks ago. We had another uh, meeting just uh, uh, for a few hours where very valuable input was received and the work that had been done to the present time was kind of laid out and critiqued. Uh, and there was some good criticism. And, I, and in talking with Dan Bacon uh, last week, just so I'd be able to report to you on this, he said the, uh, uh, the consultants are taking to heart some of the comments that were made and trying to make some adjustments so as to uh, uh, add some flexibility uh, to, uh, to the proposal. So the process goes on. Uh, hopefully, in the end, it will be very valuable and to the benefit of the Higgins Beach community, which is what is broadly perceived as uh, by the Higgins Beach community as an effort to make their zoning work with way, the way things are on the ground uh, there, the way the structures are all built. Uh, but it will also, hopefully, in the future, uh, benefit the town uh, on a broader sense. Thank you. John. So a um, couple of items. Um, first is, um, and, I, and I don't really know how to address this, but to Councillor Hayes' request for, in essence, a legal opinion, I think needs to be a group decision and shouldn't be just because one member actually requests that because there's some implications when you ask those questions. And I think that it needs to represent the entire council and the entire community. So I'm not sure how to um, go about that conversation and when and where and so forth. So. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with asking the questions. I just think that it needs to be something that we all discuss because we may have difference, differences of opinions and primarily it's because just because a citizen says so doesn't make it so. Um, you know, uh, the reason why we, nothing against you for being an attorney, but the reason why there are so many darn attorneys <laughs> is because none of them can agree with each other. So that doesn't mean that the opinion that someone got was necessarily correct. Um, so, you know, I'd like to have that conversation. Um, with respect to the recusal piece, um, you know, I really believe that the measure of leadership is how we respond to the adversity that we're faced with. And I do want to thank both uh, Councilor Donovan in particular, um, but also Councilor Blaze for stepping up and addressing um, that elephant in the room, if that's what you want to call it, uh, personally. Um, you know, we, we could go down a path where perceived prejudices could run a gambit on any issue that we have in this town. Um, in this particular issue, some people have said that others have a perceived prejudice, whether it's we have family that live down there, whether the home ownership, uh, political endorsements, political contributions, it opens that up to really a level of distrust that I think the community doesn't want. And I'll be honest, I trust every single one of you. I've never seen anybody in the 15 years that I've been around and doing this, anyone be dishonest or not have the community's best interest in the decisions. And there's really only two questions that have to be answered when making that decision. And, you know, and is can we participate in the discussion without any biases or predispositions? Um, and will each of us conduct ourselves and base our decisions based solely on the record of the proceedings in your best judgment and applying the applicable and relevant laws? Every one of us do that every day in the work that we do here, and I don't believe that any of us have any type of prejudicial uh, perception, whether it's perceived or real. Um, frankly, I think that some of the um, some of the comments around Mr. Donovan's uh, perceived prejudices are somewhat um, um, what's the word? Um, 
I want to say uh, mute, but um, they really uh, don't make sense. Um, the fact that we're reducing, um, or the recommendation at least today, is to reduce parking by a half an hour increases the value of someone's home. Um, after 20-something years of banking, that's the first one I've ever heard around that one. Um, that was a doozy. So um, there are other issues, but I think that when we live our life the way that we do, um, and, and not to be too um, obscure, you know, think about it. If a legislator um, um, had a particular issue, whether it's abortion or whether it, whatever it might be, guns, um, had some type of personal interaction around that issue, makes them then unqualified to then participate in a discussion on the matter, none of us would be able to be elected to any office and participate in our democracy. So it doesn't make sense to me that we can somehow um, try to divide and attack people. Um, it doesn't doesn't work well, at least for me. Um, I think that's enough on that particular issue, so I'll, I'll leave it for that. Um, I do want to mention clearly, um, at least my positions, because they're not on the floor yet. Um, I do support, as I stated in the last meeting, um, having one-hour parking. It was a matter of procedure for me by recommending the half hour, or at least supporting that. I do <coughs> agree with going back to that and making all the spaces the one hour. I do believe the core issue here is enforcement. And the fact is that too many times over the years we've added rules and regulations and ordinances and all these things and we've never looked at the enforcement factor and I will support and um, believe I probably will be the one um, recommending it but will support um, some type of increased enforcement that includes modernization that may include meters and, and other resource allocations which is really more of a managerial decision than it is a council decision. Um, as far as the comments around the privatization of Higgins Beach, whether it's public, private, um, I don't believe that that is the issue that's faced us, but I do want to say very clearly, if this town ever gets to a point in which we're talking about privatizing that and um, there's some enforcement around that, I'll be the first one to recommend taking it by eminent domain just as Old Orchard Beach did. Um, and you know, I don't want to upset anybody, but that has always been a uh, public access beach for us and it should always remain that. So I will support that if it ever, ever comes to that and I don't think it will. On more positive notes, um, I wanted to uh, um, tell you that I will be uh, t in some extent uh, representing um, at least a little bit of history of Scarborough um, this coming weekend up in Augusta. Um, Chris Siazzo from the school board and I will be presenting at a conference um, talking about building and managing uh, council and school board relationships and uh, we're doing that before municipal officers that will be attending a conference there. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm really excited about sharing our story and how that worked and what are some of the, still some of the challenges. I um, also want to thank, uh, if you didn't know, um, we have a full slate of candidates um, that are uh, stepping forward. Um, there are a couple people missing from that ballot that I was hoping would sign up, but um, we'll talk about that later when we say goodbyes. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for stepping forward. It takes a, um, it takes a, lot, of, uh, a lot of guts to step forward because uh, you step into the fire. Um, but I do want to say one thing. It's interesting that this past year that this community has focused very heavily on education um, particularly the discourse that has uh, resulted in some of the debate, but yet there is no competition for the school board seats. Yeah. Um, that just completely surprised me. Um, nothing against the, um, the people that are running. I think that they're great candidates based on what I've um, heard and seen. And I'm, I'm just shocked that, um, it, you know, th that much criticism can be leveled against a governing body that takes care of a big part of our community. Um, but yet um, no one steps forward, um, you know, to get into a competitive discussion around it. So, but I want to say thank you to all those that are stepping forward. And uh, last but not least, I really want to say thank you to everyone that showed up tonight and spoke. I took copious notes, um, tried to keep everyone, uh, you know, my spelling of someone's name might be a little difficult, so I'm going to rely on the town clerk um, and uh, her proofreading of uh, names and re uh, records. So uh, I will try to get in touch with those who did at least have questions or wanted um, responses. You know, that's the important part of this uh, entire process. If anything, it's something that I hope that we learned as a community as part of the school budget debate, and that was that there was a lot of lack of um, public input, and so I do appreciate that. Um, and now I'm going to leave you just with one thought, and that is, you know, um, someone, the, the last speaker mentioned that um, this issue um, is divisive, and that, um, you know, I personally want to say you're absolutely correct, but I think that we all need to look at what is causing that divisiveness, and it needs to start by us looking in the mirror. Awesome.
Okay. Thank you. So um, I won't hammer on some of the comments that are, I won't repeat some of the things that are already said, but I do want to touch on a couple things. Um, the first one I do want to just say, um, although I, I, um, I did, we had an earlier on off subject, we did have one of our first speakers was about the Benjamin Farm. Um, and, and I did just want to say, um, I, I did hear about that earlier in the week. Um, certainly, you know, as a council, I, I wish I had a better answer, but I don't, which is there really isn't anything we can do about that. Um, certainly, we can reach out, and, and, and we have. Um, and as much as I can understand, there would be some kind of an expectation of, of holding that name. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's not part of, of our relationship, of, of how we you know, came about the purchase of the Benjamin Farm. Um, we allocated the money and, and the ownership and then the rights belong with the land trust. Um, although I said I, I, I do sympathize with you, um, it's unfortunately one of those things can't do anything about. So <laughs> moving forward, um, I do want to just again touch base on something that um, Tom mentioned. We do have a new signal with new lanes on Payne and Holmes Road. And somebody almost hit me tonight trying to come to the meeting because they were maybe not paying attention to those nice new signs. Um, one is a left turn only, one is a straight. Um, so do do try to pay, make, make note that that is a little different now. Um, and last but not least, um, <clears throat> a couple quick, quick, quick things on Higgins Beach. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised, and I, and I do feel slightly guil guilty, Bill. Um, I, I realize you take a lot of the heat on this one, and it was my amendment. Um, I have kind of scratched my, my head about <laughs> that. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how, how that got flipped around, but um, that, that was my amendment. Um, I do still stand behind my amendment, um, and, and, and I stand behind it for a couple of things. Um, just, again, you know, I'm talking, you know, I talked to this conceptually from when we created the spaces, and when we created it, we were thinking scenic vista. Um, it was a little less of surfing and beaching and picnicking. It was the scenic, the scenic vista and the scenic view, which is why you had see some of the parking where you see it. Um, to, to me, the, the, the half hour was more to do with, um, you know, I know some people say, well, that's going to create more noise. Um, yes, it probably would, uh, because my intent, and I guess I should have explained that a little better, I don't believe noise is necessarily a valid argument. It's a beach, and it's a neighborhood, and cars come and go. Um, I, I thought that was somewhat self-explanatory, but maybe not. So, again, I'm just offering some insight of why, why I got to the half hour. Um, and again, you know, I looked at Co-op Beach, again, not, not necessarily because it's a great beach, but it does have some similarities at high tide, there's no beach. Um, and, and the 30 minute parking that you were looking at is to, again, it's in to enjoy the scenic vista and the scenic view. There are other uses, you know, we do now have you know, paddle boarding and kayaking, it's been rather successful from, from what I understand. Um, that, that is now done through community service right there. You know, you have the boat ramp, so on and so forth. Um, and I um, just will repeat, I'm certainly open to, you know, my, my goal was consistency. You know, again, it, if that consistency is an hour and just improving on the enforcement, I can certainly live with that. Um, I do want to repeat that my preference is that it is consistent um, between the two. And um, last but not least, I do want to just mention... Um, so just folks don't forget, um, or I'm sorry, I have a question for the town manager. We had talked about surf racks down at the drop-off. Did the surfboard racks ever go in? I believe there's one there. Yeah. They are, are in there. Um, so just a friendly reminder, we do have the drop-off where you can do the, you know, right. deposit your surfboard, come up to the parking lot and park, and then go back. Um, so with that, item number 12, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? And Aye. that is unanimous. Oh.